all in one line To make no money if I don't make it there on time You see Dallas and I'm told Why did up until I'm on I've got 14 years to get you back in my Well, good evening and welcome to the PBL Roundup Show presented by the Baseball Bureau's Scout School. I'm one of your hosts, Tom Brenneman. We'll be bouncing around all the Pioneer League games and what's going on in the league a little bit later on. Tonight, we're having a special tribute to the great Vin Scully, who, as you know, passed away last week. We've asked a few folks who knew him well to be a part of our program tonight, including legendary broadcaster Bob Costas. He'll lead things off here in just a moment. And a little bit later on, we'll be joined by my father, Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Brenneman, as well as Charlie Steiner, who worked alongside Vin going back to 2005, as well as Darren Sutton, longtime Major League Baseball announcer. His father, of course, Don Sutton, Hall of Fame pitcher, and Darren grew up around the Dodger family. Well, with each and every show, proud to be joined by my co-host, the famed comedian, actor, and baseball great, despite some of the editing you've seen lately, that's Mr. Joe List and former Angels and Mariners general manager, Bill Bavese. Gentlemen, good evening. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm doing great. Oh, good. How are you? Here. I'm doing good, Joe. I heard you were a little upset about some of the editing about uh, your baseball night playing for the Paddleheads. Well, you know, I'm a comedian, so I got comedy fans. They all like to bust chops. And uh, I really, uh, I think I got some harsh comments. I thought I did fantastic. There was some silly <laughs> music. I didn't do so great with the fly balls, but I didn't get to show off my arm. I didn't get to take infield. I didn't get to pitch. And you couldn't see where my balls were going that were launched. And uh, people want to see where my balls are going. <laughs> okay. We're staying away from that from the start. <laughs> All right, we're going to begin our show tonight on a serious note with a tribute to the great Vin Scully. And we're going to take a moment and look back on some of the moments and some of the great calls of his legendary career. Check it out. Harvey Keene, one strike away. Sandy into his windup. Here's the pitch. Swung out and missed a perfect game. On the scoreboard in right field, it is 9.46 p.m. in the city of the Angels, Los Angeles, California. And a crowd of 29,139. Just sitting in to see the only pitcher in baseball history to hurl four no-hit, no-run games 
He has done it four straight years, and now he capped it on his fourth no-hitter. He made it a perfect game. And Sandy Koufax, whose name will always remind you of strikeouts, did it with a flourish. He struck out the last six consecutive batters. So when he wrote his name in capital letters in the record books, that K stands out even more than the O-U-F-A-X. One ball and no strikes. Aaron waiting. The outfield deep and straight away. Fastball is a high drive into deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It is gone. getting a standing ovation in the deep south for breaking a record of an all-time baseball idol and it is a great moment for all of us and particularly for Henry Aaron who was met at home plate not only by every member of the Braves but by his father and mother he threw his arms around his father and as he left the home plate area his mother came running across the grass threw her arms around his neck, kissed him for all she was worth. As Aaron circled the bases, the Dodgers on the infield shook his hand, and that was a memorable moment. Aaron is being mobbed by photographers. He is holding his right hand high in the air, and for the first time in a long time, that poker face of Aaron shows the tremendous strain and relief of what it must have been like to live with for the past several months. It is over. At 10 minutes after 9 in Atlanta, Georgia, Henry Aaron has eclipsed the mark set by Babe Ruth. So the winning run is at second base with two out, three and two to Mookie Wilson. Little roller up along first. Behind the bag. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it. If one picture is worth a thousand words, you have seen about a million words. But more than that, you have seen an absolutely bizarre finish to game six of the 1986 World Series. The Mets are not only alive, they are well, and they will play the Red Sox in game seven tomorrow. But the game right now is at the plate. High fly ball into right field. She is gone! In a year that has been so improbable, the impossible has happened. Well, like many of you, I'm sure you'll never forget where you were that night of that home run by Kirk Gibson in Game 1 of the World Series back in 1988. It's a pleasure to be joined now by Bob Costas. And, Bob, uh, back in those days, uh, NBC had the Game of the Week, had mm -hmm. the rights to the World Series. Were you yeah. at that game that night? Oh, yeah. I was in the corner of the Dodger dugout, which at that time you weren't allowed to be in that position. Now it's all access, everything you can get players mic'd up and whatnot, but then technically I wasn't allowed to be there. But I was going to jump on the field and do a post-game interview with whomever, and at that point it looked like the Dodgers would lose the game. And I had two contributions, two minor contributions to that moment and the next night. As I was in the corner of the dugout, I heard a sound coming from the batting cage down the tunnel. 
and in the backboard was placing a ball on a tee, and somebody, I later found out it was Gibson, was taking swings, and you'd hear thwack, ugh, thwack, ugh. So I go down <laughs> to take a look, and then I contacted Mike Weissman in the truck, mm -hmm. and I said, he's off the trainer's table, where I had seen him a few innings earlier. He's off the trainer's table. He's in uniform. He's taking swings. I assume that means if the situation's right, he can pinch hit. So he passed that along to um, Vin and Joe. So they knew it was at least a possibility. And then Harry Coyle, the great director, is panning the dugout. And it's the buildup to all this that increases the drama. Um, parenthetically here, I think that what separated Vin Scully from even the greatest of the great among the Hall of Fame baseball announcers wasn't so much the call of the moment itself. All those calls were great, mm -hmm. but it was the framing, what led up to it, and then the coda, the postscript at the end. To appreciate Koufax's perfect game, almost impossible to believe that a perfect game can be elevated, but it was by a perfect call. You have to listen to the whole half inning. Mm -hmm. And with the Gibson thing, even though it was on television, the way it was framed in the pregame show, the first thing I said, not that it was anything terrific on my part, it was just obvious. First item of business, Kirk Gibson won't play, won't suit up, won't be on the field for the national anthem, not available for so much as pinch hitting duty. Then as the game unfolds, Ben and Joe are mentioning it. Now knowing that he might pinch hit, Harry Coyle is panning the empty dugout. There's no Gibson. There's no Gibson. So finally he comes and sits down, but he could be just there to kind of cheer his teammates on. Then he gets up and limps to the on-deck circle. And then not incidentally, Tom, you know how this stuff happens. The count was three and two, and there were several foul balls. Yeah. Not that I could ever equal Vin Scully, but I called Derek Jeter's last at-bat at Yankee Stadium. And damn it, with no consideration for me, he hit the first pitch. <laughs> I, I had a few things in mind. I was going to say, hey, this is the way baseball is. Sometime the bold face names intersect with guys whose names have been seen only in agate type. On the mound for the <laughs> Orioles, Evan Ruth. At second base, pinch runner Antoine Richardson. And at the plate, Derek Jeter. And it turns out that was the last pitch Evan Meek ever threw and the last run Antoine Richardson ever scored in the major leagues. But Jeter hit the first pitch, and that was that. So all the buildup was out the window. <laughs> you know, but it, with Gibson's at bat, the count goes to three and two. He's limping down the first baseline on a little nub grounder. And Vin is able to take all those moments and build the anticipation. No matter how it pays off, he's framed the drama. And then the call is great, but so was Jack Buck's call great yep. on the radio. I don't believe what I just saw. Yep. But Vin has that postscript. In a year that has been so improbable, the impossible has happened. So it's that. I think from a broadcasting standpoint, it's the framing, the anticipation and the building drama, and then tying a ribbon around it. That's what elevated Vin above the rest of us. You know, Bob, I want to ask you about the funeral. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's not oftentimes we talk about someone's funeral. Um, yeah. the, the one funeral I'll never forget as long as I live uh, was Harry Carey's funeral. Um, he had two of them, one in Palm Springs and Pete Van Aken does a eulogy in, right. in Chicago. It was, it was, it, I would recommend to anyone to go to YouTube and, and, and watch and listen to that mm -hmm. eulogy. It is just it is fantastic. But my dad was there. You were there. And yes. he said the thing that struck him was in a city of stars, Los Angeles, where everything is built up bigger than life and Hollywood and on and on and on. He said he was just struck by the fact that not one single celebrity got up there to speak, uh, to right. eulogize Vin, that it was his his children, his grandchildren, and, and my dad said, you know, I'm not sure there's anything that could speak more of a man who had accomplished so much, but his ego never got in the way. And that's the way that funeral was. Did, did that strike you the most or was yeah. there something else there? Well, I think everything about it, the tone of it, what uh, the presiding priests said, there were yep. two of them, uh, the feeling within the church itself, the people who came from great distances Sandy Koufax, Joe Torrey, we're talking about men in their 80s. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have been marked absent necessarily. Everyone would have understood, but they wanted to be there. Your dad coming from Cincinnati. Uh, I had a game that night in San Diego, but I wasn't going to miss the service and drove mm -hmm. down the coast and called the game that night. Uh, there was a sense of real appreciation, and you didn't have to discuss very much. You saw a lot of people you hadn't seen in some cases in many mm -hmm. years. 
but you all pretty much had the same thought about Vin Scully and what he meant. And I think I had this conversation with Vin once a few years ago, and he was telling me it was 2016 and all the bouquets were being thrown his way as he was going on his last tour as an announcer. Mm -hmm. And he felt like he'd been, as he put it, over honored and over praised. And I said, Vin, within broadcasting, think of it this way. Sure, all of us admire your unequaled ability and we're grateful for how gracious you've always been toward all of us. But if we love the game and if we love our craft, who is it that embodies that to the greatest extent? Mm -hmm. You do. So part of what we feel here, the largest part is about you, but some of it is about the game and the craft and you more than anybody else have embodied it for such a long time. Forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but um, I think that what makes Vin so incomparable, almost beyond incomparable, isn't just his unique combination of abilities, but the circumstances of his career, which could never be equal. If somehow a 25-year-old Vin Scully, someone of equal ability, materialized today, would that person wind up in the Broadcasting Hall of Fame? Of course they would. But... Here's a guy who starts in the middle of the 20th century with one of the most consequential teams in the history of American sports, Jackie Robinson's Boys of Summer Dodgers, and then out to Los Angeles. You know, and Bill and his family know all about this. Out to Los Angeles, where radio is still primary. And not incidentally, baseball is the unquestioned national pastime. When he winds up doing games on national radio in the World Series or national television in the 80s on NBC, the World Series is getting ratings of 35 and 40. Yep. The whole country is transfixed by this. And of course, he rises to every moment, but it means more to more people than unfortunately it does today. And then as the years go by, he's grandfathered in. I don't know if someone with his approach, even if they were just as good at it, which is hard to imagine, would be as embraced today. Mm -hmm. But then he's grandfathered in. And every one of his broadcasts is simultaneously a news bulletin of tonight's game and a flashback to every game you've ever experienced, every word you've ever heard him utter. He's present and nostalgic at the same time. Yep. That set of circumstances can never again be equal. You know, what, what are the odds that Henry Aaron hits the homer against the Dodgers? Kurt Gowdy was on national TV. Milo Hamilton had a very good call on yep. Braves radio, but Vin was there to put the Vin Scully touch on it. You know, it wasn't just how great he was. He would have been great if he was the voice of the Toledo Mud Hens. And for his own quirky reasons, he never wanted to leave Toledo. <laughs> Word would still get out that this was one of the greatest announcers ever. But you have the greatest baseball broadcaster who went for the greatest period of time and intersected with the greatest number of indelible moments that aren't just Dodger moments, they're national moments. How can you ever have that confluence of circumstances again? Uh, Bill, you wanted to, to kind of pick up on that theme through the years. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Bob, thanks so much for doing this. It, it's so oh, great to be with you. It's an honor. Um, you know, uh, I I grew up listening to him, and and uh, it was uh, a real. Vin was just a huge part of our life, um, but he was for everybody in Los Angeles. So I want to get your take on on Vinny nationally. So if you walk into Dodger Stadium, I'm not sure you'll find a more diverse crowd than you do find in Do Dodger Stadium. They're all, they're all shapes and sizes and, and colors, and they all love Vin Scully. Yes. Love him. This guy took us through the Watts riots. He took us through, through the, the Vietnam War. He took us through 9-11. Um, and he really, if you, if you gr grew up in Southern California, he really took you through those. You, know, you weren't just hearing Dodger baseball. You were listening to Vin Scully. And so on a national level, is, I, I, guess, I, I guess that's just, just an open-ended question and your thoughts on that? I think that it's impossible for somebody in, uh, you know, uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, to as fully appreciate Vin Scully as Dodger fans would or people who grew up in Southern California and experienced him on a night-to-night -night basis. But I think if you're a baseball fan, you know who Vin Scully is. Um, most baseball fans are only familiar with their own local announcer and maybe a handful of guys who do games on network television. But Vin's fame, both because of his greatness and because of how long he endured, if you're a baseball fan, you know who Vin Scully is. And there were so many tributes, both written and broadcast to him in his last season of 2016 
and now upon his death, uh, that you'd, you'd have to be a hermit not to have received at least some some sense of what he meant to the game. Joe? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, uh, and and also honored to be even part of this uh, conversation. But yeah, I just would add that um, I don't know if it's a question, but Finn Scully for me, I, I was born in '82, so I mean, those coming up, those the the Red Sox Mets. I'm a New Englander, a Boston guy, yeah. And that Dodgers World Series, that was uh, baseball to me, was the voice of Vin Scully, and I would watch mm -hmm. those games over and over again. And it's hard because you realize. I love play by play in baseball. It's just hours and hours and hours and hours with these people. So it feels like they're part of your life. And, and Joe Clastiglione is the Boston guy who's getting ready to be done. And Dennis Eckersley just announced his retirement and Jerry Remy passed away last year. Vin Scully retired. Keith Jackson was such a big part of my life. And you feel like your childhood is like falling away with these guys. Cause baseball, particularly these play by play guys are such a deep part of the fabric of your childhood. And I, that's not a well, question. That's just something to yeah. say. Well, as, as Tom and his dad know, baseball is different from any other sport. Mm -hmm. There are baseball announcers mm -hmm. who do other sports quite well. But there are also many announcers who excel at almost every sport and are just so-so at baseball because it's completely different. The pace and rhythm of it are different. And it's an everyday game and you're a companion, especially the local announcer mm -hmm. is a companion. Every game isn't life and death. Every game isn't a spectacle. It's rightly called a pastime, as quaint as that may sound. Um, and it's a storyteller's game because of the pace and rhythm of the game. Now, sometimes today, that pace is a plodding pace. But it's, <laughs> supposed to have, it's supposed to have a pleasing, leisurely pace, which it has had for most of its history. And the best baseball announcers are well attuned to that pace and rhythm. And nobody was better attuned to that than them. Now, working alone helped. And some people, those who like to quibble and find something to criticize, mm -hmm. said, oh, well, he didn't want to share the booth. And at first I thought, maybe 40 years ago, that thought crossed my mind. But then I realized that's a vestige of how it was done when Vin broke in. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting next to Red Barber, but Red had his innings. And Jerry Doggett or Connie Desmond had their innings. And then Vin had his innings. And the other guy would hand it over to them, would just sit there and keep score. But they weren't doing a dual broadcast. And he learned to broadcast that way. And when you do it that way, then you can orchestrate the silences as well as the words you speak. Vin was famous for laying out for long periods of time after big moments or for letting a picture say what it said and putting just a little caption beneath it. But if he had a long story to tell, he could tell it and let it unfold at his own pace. So he would have been, his artistry would have been less if there was someone else in the booth. Now, of course, in the 80s yeah. with Joe Garagiola, mm -hmm. they adapted. And Joe figured out a way to be consequential, not to just be a sidekick, but to still matter, but to let Vin establish the tone of the broadcast. And that was a tribute to both of them. Uh, so, yeah, you know, what you said, Joe, is right. Uh, a good hometown announcer, Marty Brenneman in Cincinnati, Ernie Harwell in Detroit, Mel Allen and Red Barber back of the day in New York, Jack Buck, um, in St. Louis, where he was every bit as beloved as Vin was in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It's just a smaller, it's a smaller city, although the Cardinals were a big regional franchise. Mm -hmm. So it did reach into a, a good portion of the Midwest and Southeast and, and Southwest. And uh, Harry Carey, of course, in both Chicago and yep. St. Louis. And I've never, I was at that funeral in Chicago too. Mm -hmm. And it's the only funeral I've ever been at where you could say, it was so damn entertaining. No I've doubt. Never been so entertained at a funeral. As no was. doubt. No doubt. What what a piece of work Pete Van Aken was. I, I yeah. used to hang around with him and Harry so many nights of my life and, uh, and, and live to tell about him. I'm curious, Bob, with everything you've accomplished in your career, and I mean, you've been a Hall of Famer in everything. I mean, it, it, you know, if they're Olympic Games, NFL, boxing, hockey, football, all these kinds of things. Very successful people tend to think of things they didn't do as opposed to maybe some of the things they yeah. did do, uh, at least those that I've talked to through mm. the years. Was there ever a part of you that looks back now or maybe while you were going through it uh, that wishes you would have done local baseball for a team, even if it were only for a season? Yeah, but, you know, it's like, well, if I did that, then yeah. I might not have done some of the other stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would have enjoyed that very much. Uh, I enjoy being around the game. 
Uh, when I lived in St. Louis, as I did for most of my adult life, I'd probably go to 30 or 40 Cardinal games a year that I wasn't broadcasting, you know, and just hang around the batting cage, the clubhouses, the dugouts. You absorb so much baseball. You know that you learn by osmosis, mm -hmm. uh, being on the bus, sometimes being on the plane or around uh, the ball players and the executives, uh, the people that know the game and go back a ways. Uh, and you store all that. People say, how do you prepare for a broadcast? Well, you prepare as hard as you can specifically, but a lot of what you bring to the booth is stuff you didn't even know you were going to use in that broadcast, but it pops into your head. Yeah. You know, something Buzzy Bavese told me way back when, pops into my head. You know, if you're Vin Scully, that he just had a larger treasure chest of that than anybody ever has. When he could say, you know, I met Connie Mack once. <laughs> I don't know how many people can say that. <laughs> Connie Mack was born in 1862 during the Civil War. And there will be somebody involved in baseball in 2062. Some young person, could be Joe Davis, who succeeded him, will still be around in 2062. And they can say, I knew Vin Scully. And forget yeah. about six degrees of Kevin Bacon. With one person, Vin Scully, you could connect 200 years. 1862 yeah. to 2062. I mean, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's, so it's so true. What are your thoughts, Bob, about uh, the state of the game today? Um, I mean, there are a yeah. million arteries we could take off of that heartbeat, of course, and, and veins. But but the overall state of the game, according to Bob Costas right now, is, is what? Healthy? Uh, life support? Somewhere in between? Well, not, not life support. I, I think still quite healthy but it's always compared to what it used to be and then it's compared to football which is the colossus not just in sports but in all of american entertainment you look at the top 100 tv shows in a year yeah. like 85 or 90 of them are nfl games yeah. it's the only thing that consistently cuts through in an, in an increasingly fractionalized media universe but baseball is still a nine to ten billion dollar a year industry uh Tens and tens of millions of people attend baseball games every year. More than that, I guess, if you put all the teams together. Well, maybe I'm wrong. But tens of millions. There you go. Um, and, and obviously, they, people consume baseball in different ways. The national TV ratings aren't nearly what they were. But local TV ratings in most markets and the regional uh, networks do very well. Mm -hmm. And people follow baseball on the MLB network or streaming or whatever it might be. And I think there are as many or more good young players, exciting young players, as there have ever been. But everybody knows that pace of play is an issue. And it isn't just the time of the game. It's the feel of the game. No. And is there enough action in the game? Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the strikeout totals now, the overall league strikeout average equals pretty much Nolan Ryan's career average. You know, one like 25 to 26 percent of at-bats end in strikeouts. Now, if Nolan Ryan's doing that or Randy Johnson or Roger Clemens, that's what you bought the ticket for. Mm -hmm. But if four relievers combine to do that, it's kind of a snooze fest. You want the ball in play. Yep. You want guys running the bases. You want relays and balls in the gap and that sort of stuff. You want action. And they're well aware of that. And Theo Epstein, one of the brightest minds in the game, is working with the commissioner's office to try and address some of that. Uh, outlawing shifts, I think, is going to be part of it. Uh, limiting the number of pitchers on the roster is going to be part of it. Incentivizing things that, uh, that push them toward a different approach. It can't all be home runs, strikeouts, and walks. Yeah. Yeah. Billy? No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I've listened to Theo's thoughts on it, and I, you know, on the shift, I've always fought the idea of the shift because I, I think you, you're just you're just promoting unathletic players. Uh, you know, the, if you can't be the shift, are you really an athlete? Um, but I see his point that if we do outlaw the shifts now, all of a sudden, Bob, you got to go out and get and get a shortstop who can play shortstop. Right now, mm -hmm. if we if we have the shifts, I can get a little bit less athletic shortstops and, and and I can get somebody that that can just come in with some launch angle and, and stand at shortstop and I'm going to move them around and, and get them in the right spot so I see what he's saying I have a long way to go though to really be in favor of shifts but it's real it's a it's it's tough and I couldn't agree with you more about it it, it all comes down to, to the pace of the game you know your point Bill I think is often overlooked people look at shifts and they say it's taking base hits away primarily from slower left-handed power hitters and that's true. But over the last few years, I've come to think, I don't have the exact data, but the ball up the middle, that's always mm -hmm. been a 
to hit. The ball over second base is often now a routine out. Mm -hmm. But think if it was just slightly to the shortstop side of second base, the classic shortstop side, that's where Ozzie Smith made his living. That's yeah. where Omar Vizquel made his living and lived in the imagination of fans, making spectacular plays. To your point, with shifts, there are fewer spectacular plays. Yep. 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 And that, that was Theo's point is that if we if we outlaw the shifts, then you got to go find yourself a real shortstop. And he's well, going to play shortstop. They're out there. You know, yeah. Fernando yeah. Tatis is out there. Other oh, yeah. Guys out there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, yeah. There's so much athleticism in the game now that, you know, I, I think that they'll always adjust. One of the things that's troubled me is that so few guys have learned to bunt or to try mm -hmm. to go the opposite way. Now, do, going the opposite way is is harder than people think. It's not a matter of just I'll I'll hit the ball to the left side where there's nobody there. But, you know, if Tony Gwynn or Rod Carew were playing today and you you shifted on them, which they wouldn't because they, they, they'd learn in a week that it was a bad thing to do. But if they insisted on shifting on them, those guys might very well hit 400. Because they just yeah. ping, ping, ping. Ichiro, ping, ping. Yeah. Yeah. Joe? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. I, I wonder, I'm wondering, a question for all three of you guys. Are any of you guys familiar with John Boy on YouTube? Oh, I love John Boy. This guy, I think, could single-handedly save the game. I, I'm a baseball guy, a fanatic, and I watch and I learn so much. And it, it, he's so good. Like, they got to get him more involved because he's, he's unbelievable. These videos are tremendous. And I think it would bring in more football people because it shows the edge of baseball is what he does such he, a great job of. He posts them every day. He posts them every day. And not only is he insightful, he's funny as hell. Yes. His narrations are really good. And I think it appeals to a traditional baseball fan, but also a young person you're trying to bring in, a 22-year-old guy who isn't sure about baseball. He makes it feel cool. Absolutely. And it show getting these arguments and the lip reading and the, yeah. the fighting, because there's, there's fury in baseball that people don't think of. My, my family, a lot of them look at that They're a baseball family, but they still look at it as soft. And uh, they like football and hockey. They're more football hockey people. And I'm like, if you could see these guys screaming at each other and swearing at each other and the tension and throwing at each other, use that stuff. And uh, I just think he's great for the game. Joe, have you shared with Bob Costas that you're, you actually are a professional baseball player? Have, have, you, have you shared that with Bob at all? I haven't, Bob. I, uh, well, first of all, I want to say, Bob, we, we went through a security line at LaGuardia Airport a few years ago together. I was right behind you. And, and really? being a celebrity myself, I didn't bother you. Oh, well, yeah. Um, but, I, but I, I did. noticed you, but I figured that there would be a crowd gathering around you. If the people see the two of us together, forget about it. The oh, airlines fine. are going to shut down. Uh, but no, so I, I got to play professional ball one one day it's on youtube we'll send you the link um and i'll send you an autographed hat but the, <laughs> the, the editor screw you know about editing i'm I sure I you wasn't getting paid for this <laughs> <laughs> the editor who's on the call here he screwed me he put in some of my not so great plays and i smoked a few and he didn't show where the ball landed and he added some clown music so oh well <laughs> He played you know, in the Pioneer League, Bob, in a game a couple of weeks really? ago. He actually coached first base better than he played. But, um, you know, what we're doing here, Bob, is this year on this show is every week we, we tied it in with your alma mater, uh, Syracuse Are University you? with a yeah. new house school. And we have students that are on our show every week. Really? Uh, reviewing the games, recapping the games from the Falk School of Analytics yeah. and from the new house school of communication. So we have one of our students – who we're calling the dean, if you will, because Matthias Altman Kurosaki is actually getting his master's degree right now. He's at Syracuse right now, a Newhouse School grad, and, and we, we wow. said we'd allow him to ask the great Bob Costas of Syracuse fame one question. Take it away, Matthias. You're on the big Better stage. Better be good, my friend. Make it a good one. Awesome. Thank you. It, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Bob. It's, it's really an honor to be uh, on the screen with someone who – I, I haven't known a sports world without. So my question is, obviously, since you're also a Newhouse grad, what's the biggest skill or maybe the biggest lesson that you picked up that has helped you through your pretty lengthy and successful career? The biggest thing I picked up at Syracuse or anywhere along the way? Uh, Syracuse, but I guess also anywhere along the way. Well, it sounds trite, but preparation. And since we started this speaking about Vin Scully, he was always fond of quoting the great actor, Sir Lawrence Olivier. 
the key to success is the humility to prepare and then the confidence to bring it off. You can't wander into the booth. I know some people do and they get by on personality and that's them and I'm not criticizing them. But I feel like I can't walk into the booth and say, well, I did pretty well last year or 10 years before and I can just sit down and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to put the work in. And once you put that work in and you sit down, you're not guaranteed to have your best broadcast, mm -hmm. but you know at least there'll be a baseline that you won't fall beneath. And that helps to relax you. It's just, maybe it's just me. If I feel less than fully prepared, it makes me feel anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing you want to feel, especially on a baseball broadcast, because you want to sound relaxed throughout and then pick up the pitch when the moment allows for it. It's different than constant action games like basketball uh, and hockey and big spectacle games like football. You have to be relaxed to call a baseball game well and then turn the register up when the circumstance calls. All right, Matthias, here you go, my friend. Yeah, thank you so much, Bob. I just wanted to say also my downstairs neighbor, the guitarist Steve Kahn, uh, wanted to give his regards to you. Oh, my gosh. Tell Steve I said hi. Is he keeping of course. you up at night, like at 2 o'clock in the morning playing Inagata De Vida or something? <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I live upstairs from him. So okay. uh, he lives on the second floor. I live on the eighth floor. So I'm good. There you go. You're All good. right. Awesome. Thank you. Bye, thank you so man. much. Bye. Well, Bob, before we let you get out of here, I just want to say thanks so much for your time. I mean, obviously, you've got uh, everybody and his brother that would like to have you as part of their program. So thank you for joining thank us here you. tonight. It's been great having you. It's, it's great to see you, Tom and Bill and Joe and uh, – Thank Forgive me if I'm staying too long here, but since we began on Vin and you mentioned Harry Carey, uh, yeah. this is a chance to tell a story about each that probably oh. people haven't heard before. Sure. I asked every Vin Scully question and every Harry Carey question. And I, these aren't entirely new, but they've rarely been heard. Uh, Harry took a liking to me for whatever reason. And, you know, before lights were at Wrigley Field, you'd go, if you're doing the Saturday game of the week with Tony Kubek, you go to the Friday afternoon game yeah. and then you go out to dinner. And he, of course, was the mayor of Rush Street. And he'd grab me and say, come on, kid, let's go. And I don't know how old he was. He'd shaved years off his actual age. So at that point, he's probably in his 70s. And I'm in my 30s. And I look like I'm 17. And the reason he could sell Budweiser like nobody else is that he believed in the product. Trust me. And <laughs> it's like did. in the morning. And it's unbelievable. We, we stopped at several places along Rush Street. Now we wind up at Harry Carey's appropriately. And it's before cell phones, but people have their little Polaroid cameras. And everybody from 90-year-old people who want to talk to them about, like, Fred Lindstrom and Cookie Lava Jetto or something, <laughs> to pretty young girls. They all want a moment. They all want an autograph. They all want a picture. And finally, I look around, survey the scene, and I said, Harry, what's it all about? And he goes, what's it all about, kid? I'll tell you what it's all about. Booze, broads, baseball, and bullshit. <laughs> As well, words of wisdom, right? <laughs> yes, they are. That pretty much sums it up. <laughs> now, now, Vin Scully, right? Vin gets the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2016. It's Barack Obama's last ceremony for the Presidential Medal of Freedom, a couple of months before he leaves office, and he empties the bucket. He's got everybody there. Robert De Niro, Tom Hanks, Robert Redford, Michael Jordan, Ellen DeGeneres, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Diana Ross, Bill and Melinda Gates, Bruce Springsteen, Scully, and I'm leaving some people out. So before the ceremony begins, uh, Vin was nice enough to invite me and my wife, Jill, to the ceremony. So before the ceremony begins, we're in some room adjacent to the East Room, and it's almost shoulder to shoulder, and all these bold faced names everywhere you look. So I can't tell the story without dropping a name. And I'm just making small talk with Tom Hanks, and he can see what's behind me. And he goes, hey, what do you think that conversation is like? And I look, and in a corner, just the two of them, away from everybody else, deep in conversation, Vin Scully and Bruce Springsteen. And Hank says, Hank says, what do you think that conversation is like? And I said, I'll take a crack at it, Tom. You know, Bruce, I love <laughs> greetings from Asbury Park. But you really get it out of the park with darkness on the edge of town. Foul. Back to the screen, two and two. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> Bravo to that. I mean, that's as good as anything you've done on the Olympic Games right there. Yeah, that, that's a good one. <laughs>
I don't think <laughs> Hanks could do as good a Scully as you just did. <laughs> no way. I, I have only three invitations I could do, and they're all sportscasters. I can do a decent Marv Albert, a decent Cosell, and a decent Vince Scully. <laughs> do you do a Keith Jackson at all? Keith, I feel like Keith is very imitatable. No, you got to get Roy Firestone in to do his whole yeah. Nelly thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, good stuff. that's good stuff. Bob, thank you for your time. We really yeah, thank, you, thank you so much. much. See you. Thank great you, Bob. Costas. Have a great night. Boy, what a pleasure that was. Uh, yeah, that was great. That's the way the show is going to go tonight. Uh, we talked about the others we're going to have on board here tonight. Bill, I know you had a chance earlier to speak with a guy, and many of you, you know, maybe know Charlie Steiner. And, and in some ways, if you don't live in Southern California, maybe the last time you remember seeing Charlie Steiner is when he was doing Sports Center. He was fantastic at it. He was one of the great anchors in the history of Sports Center. But his love was play by play. And the Dodgers gave him that opportunity after the Yankees originally did. So he goes and starts calling Dodger baseball alongside Vin Scully for the last 11 years of Vin's career. And Bill had a chance to talk about Vin Scully with Charlie Steiner. I've got Charlie Steiner here with us, Tom. And, and uh, Charlie, thanks so much for doing this. My pleasure. Good to see you, Bill. Great seeing you. You know, um, I believe uh, you grew up a Dodgers fan, uh, a Brooklyn, then Los Angeles Dodgers fan, which makes you kind of unique. Uh, so it must have been great for you, maybe even surreal, to join a Dodgers broadcast team led by, led by Vin Scully. Um, that, that's got to be a great experience. Can, can you? Kind of tell us a little bit about that? Sure. When I was five years old, growing up on Long Island, um, the first time I listened to a baseball game was the Brooklyn Dodgers on a big old brown radio in a very small kitchen. And I heard the crack of the bat, the sound of the crowd, and this wonderful voice of little did I know at the time, 25-year-old Vin Scully. Um, <laughs> And the first time I heard him, that was what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, and so I was, I don't know if that was a blessing or a curse, but that was all I ever wanted to do. Um, and by the time I was six, I graduated downstairs to the basement where we had a black and white RCA Victor television, where I turned the sound down and started announcing games to an audience of two. My mom and my dad, who had their fingers in their ears while I was doing it. Uh, the Dodgers then moved away when I was eight. And so my career plan was dashed, at least in the short term. But there was never any doubt about what it was I wanted to do. And again, I can't tell you how fortunate I was and have been to uh, have had the occupational and life path that uh, began with Vin. Um, and so he has been in my life doing the math now about 68 years. And I think that is part of the outpouring of grief and mourning about the passing of Vin at the age of 94. He has been a part of everybody's life, everybody's life. Um, and so when he passed away, I think it was a real test of our own mortality. Uh, and an understanding of how truly special he was. The other day, for really the first time, I kind of understood Lou Gehrig on July 4th, 1939, on such a profoundly sad day, he considered himself the luckiest man on the face of the planet. And I felt the same way, uh, profoundly sad about the passing of Vin, yet on the other hand, to have experienced so much of my life personally as a kid and as a young uh, up-and-coming broadcaster and then for the past 18 years with the Dodgers. Um, so I, I, I felt that sadness and yet I felt this sense of gratitude that I was able to be around Vin and, and learn so much from him. Yeah, that that uh, that's a fascinating take on that. I really appreciate that. So, you, you know, you worked with him from, I believe, 2005 through his right. retirement in 2016. And and I'm going to ask you a real basic, what might sound like a stupid question, but I want to ask you about your relationship with Vinny. And uh, I know it's basic. I know it's open-ended, maybe kind of, kind of a lame question. But there's two reasons I want to ask it. Because, you know, his 
his relationships with everybody small big didn't matter what, what it was he made everybody feel kind of special so I'm, I'm sure he made you feel spe special and then t the second reason is you know when when he was there and you were with him you guys had a real unique um in-game tv and radio rotation mm -hmm. you know? and it wasn't very easy but you know so so you, you have a pretty unique perspective on that and, and a different relationship than the rest of us might, I might have had so I, I wanted to ask you about that well, I'll begin with uh, November of 2004, when I'm about to uh, take the job with the Dodgers. You know, again, I had grown up on Long Island, and my mom at the time was 94. And then I had to explain to her why I was leaving New York to go to Los Angeles. This is in the home in which I grew up listened to Vin, began my broadcasting career in 1955 in the basement. And so I, I came out to the house that day and I, I could have been in the newspapers. What was I going to do? Was I going to return to the Yankees? Was I going to do this or that? And at that point, nothing about the Dodgers had been printed. So I got home that day and I said, Mom, do you remember the team I grew up rooting for? And she said, oh, yes, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Do you remember the first ballpark that I went to? And my mom said, oh, yes, Ebbets Field with your dad, yes. And then I said, do you remember the announcer I wanted to be like? And she didn't quite remember. And I said, Ben Scully. And at that moment, she said, oh, good. When do we move to Los Angeles? She did. She uh, came out here, lived in assisted living, got to hear me do Dodger games for a couple of years, which was wonderful. So now I'm in the middle of this seminal moment for me, uh, my life, my career in the home in which I grew up. And it's, uh, it's kind of nerve wracking. Then suddenly the cell phone rings and I see a 323 area code. Mm. Okay, so I figured it was the Dodgers or something. Hello, Charlie, it's Vin. I just want to welcome you to the Dodger family. And I said, Mom, I believe I have to take this call. And it was just that singular moment where all of it came to be. You know, again, in the home in which I grew up, where I listened to Vin, and there he was in my ear on my phone. It was uh, the, maybe the single most wonderful moment uh, maybe of my life. Uh, a few days later, I, I come out to Los Angeles um, and I'm introduced to the media. And uh, I had known Vin for a brief period of time, you know, just in passing, having been an ESPN announcer and so on. Um, and so from the moment I got here, he was instantly welcoming. And he just was wonderful about all of that. And uh, it was it was just again one of those wonderful relationships and over time uh then mo rick monday and a fellow named billy delury the four of us would have dinner every night before every game um and there was upwards of a thousand dinners so we we had this wonderful bond and friendship and you know I am so fortunate, and I go back to the that Lou Gehrig vibe that, you know, I am the luckiest man on the face of the planet, having known Vin, worked with Vin, and uh, having been friends with Vin. Yeah, that, that uh, you know, by the, by the way, I know exactly which table you were sitting at every night, too. The, um, the, the idea... And we were back in the corner in that press room, and, and then uh, as the years went on, the door started to close because people started to come in. <laughs> they were closing the door on me. <laughs> you know, guys like, guys like, stiffs like, like me. You know, one of the beautiful things about Dodger Stadium is it is, it is uh, arguably, <clears throat> excuse me, the most diverse sporting crowd you'll ever see. If you go through the whole sta stadium, you've got all shapes, sizes, and colors. Um, I'm not really sure where I'm going with this, except that Vinny took a lot of us through the Watts riots, um, the Vietnam War, 9-11. Uh, 
And um, I don't know, and I want to, you know, you, you, you're so uh, entrenched in this profession and, and you'll have a better grasp of this than do I, but I'm not sure there's anybody with any major league sporting team, take any of them you want to talk, talk about, who has more influence over a large section of a state. And, and I'd say he's influencing from central California on down into towards San, San Diego. And, and you're not just listening to a Dodger game, you're listening to Vin Scully. And I want to know, if, I guess, you know, how he affected or, or what you saw from your perspective. I saw that as a kid's from a kid's perspective, but what's your perspective on, on that? And is there anybody else even like that? Never has been, and I doubt that there ever will be again. Uh, the one thing about Vin, and when we did the uh, uh, the ceremony for him on on Friday night, I said that he was uh, he was a friend, he was an uncle, he was your favorite teacher, he was a calming influence, and the the remarkable thing about his life and career, 67 years with the Dodgers. He became the voice of the Dodgers at the age of 25. Uh, and, and so we all grew up with him. And so when he spoke of 9-11 or he spoke of Watts, he had such credibility, such, um, such a grasp of what it was we needed and I've said this many times in, in the past week, Vin was as comfortable in his own skin as anybody I have ever been around. Um, nothing seemed to phase him. I think he understood his role, although he would never talk about it. He didn't like talking much about himself. And so when bad stuff happened, um, he was able to explain it and calm us down. And when good stuff happened, uh, fly ball deep to right, um, we 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 experienced joy along with him. He he had an utterly unique relationship with uh, his audience, his fan base, and like I said, nobody, but nobody will ever have that again. I don't believe anybody had it before him. Either. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears a little little bit here. We've got. Um, a lot of kids working for the Pioneer League that are are in the Syracuse uh, Newhouse School of Communication, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and so uh, you know what it, they'll. I know that's a step down from the Bradley. Uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you, Bill. Very nice. uh, congratulations on that. I was reading about that. That what a what a prestigious honor to have have the School of Communications named named after you. I was just lucky. I just happened to go there. Um, and those who were there, who actually preceded me, included um, Chick Hearn, Ralph Lawler, Bob Miller, uh, Bill King. Um, and now I get to the point where it's Denny Matthews with the, the Royals. It, it was an incredible uh, collection of uh, baseball and sports broadcasters who just happened to go there. And as the years went on, uh, being more alive than most of them, they, they asked me if I would uh, lend my name to the school. I said, sure, as long as you give it back at some point. Uh, but it's re it, it really is a, a, one of the great highlights of, of, of my life and career. We've got 120 kids who are majoring in sports communication, and I think we're getting close to having a, a, a master's program. So that is also a byproduct of, of all of this that began with me listening to Vin at the age of five. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, congratulations. It's that, that's a great honor and, and it's not luck, but for, for those students, you know, one thing, you know, you've gone through a career um, and I want to ask you about a few things, but one, you don't take yourself very seriously. No. It doesn't appear. And I think that's something our kids need to hear at least maybe a sentence from you about what, what, how do you, how did that come about? Did you, you know, is it just personality or do you un understand that, Hey, this is a long grinding road. Uh, I, I think it came from my parents who were really yeah. ego less. Um, and if I ever got a little full of myself, boy, I'd hear about it in a heartbeat. 
Um, and, and one of the things that has driven me being on the air now, geez, 55 years, I started when I was 18, um, is that when I am talking to an audience, I'm really more uh, attuned to the billions of people who aren't. And that gets me through. So if I screw up, what am I going to do? Uh, in the Sports Center days, we used to have meetings after Sports Center, and I always said, This is moronic. And they would say, Why? Because the program is on its way to Pluto and we can't get it back. Um, and so I go about my business, and, and very much like Ben. Um, and again, there's so many ways I, I tried to pattern myself over the course of my career. Then the best who ever did it would do it as well as anybody or better than anybody. And then he'd go home at the end of the day. And then he would inevitably, there's a phone call that has just been silenced. I'm sorry. Um, and, and, and so he, he didn't like being in crowds. He didn't like being in, 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 in rooms and he was, he liked a controlled environment, which I did. Uh, and I asked him about that. Uh, again, being, uh, have, establishing a relationship with him. I said, well, how, how do you deal with, with crowds and, and people and events where you have to be? And he provided me the answer with four B's. Okay, what are the four B's? Be there, be early, be seen, be gone. And, and that's then, and that's one of the things that, uh, that uh, makes me more comfortable and not being comfortable in those settings. He was exactly like that. He just wanted to go home and be with his family. The, um... Another one for the for the, the aspiring uh, professionals. You know, you made a great call in two thousand three, the ALCS and oh. home home run. And you know, you're you're well known for a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of things, Charlie. But that was a terrific call. And I want to ask you another dumb question: Are those things? I mean, is that just you're just lucky? You just say the right thing at the right time, or are you starting the inning thinking, you know, something's about to break here? I like this matchup. Boom. Well, in that inning. You know, it was extra innings. John Sterling and I, when the game would end, he would do the 10th, I'd do the 11th, he'd do, and go back and forth. It mm -hmm. just happened that it was the 11th inning. And in the postseason, they add 30 seconds to the uh, the commercial load between innings. And <laughs> uh, the radio station added about 45 seconds because they could generate more revenue. So we come out of the commercial break and uh, John quickly introduces me and first pitch, uh, Boone hits it out off, off Wakefield. So it, that, again, it just happened. And had it come 15 seconds earlier, it would have been the Heidi Bowl. Um, but one of the things I learned over the years, you can't don't ever think you can prepare a call. Mm. I, I, I learned that the hard way. In, in, in 2001, uh, I did the last 13 games for Barry Bonds. Uh, so I called home runs 68 through 73, which was, again, just from a baseball perspective, it was great fun. And, and, and it, I learned a lot because I, I tried to craft something for his 70th home run. I wrote a little note here, there, trying to be, you know, I was trying to be whatever, but whatever it was didn't work. And it was, I just, it, I brutalized the call. Mm -hmm. And I learned and reminded myself from that point on, just tell them what you see. And, uh, and that would then subsequently pay off, uh, for the Boone home run and, and others along the way. But no, I, I don't prepare that. You know, you've covered enough games over the period of time where you would think you have some credibility with the audience. And most importantly, you're comfortable in your own skin that, okay, here's the moment. I've done these things before. And every once in a while, you just you know, stick the landing and, and the boon call we did. 
you know, I was going to, I was going to close this out by asking you, Hey, what's, uh, how did, how did, how did Vin, Vinny in, influence you? But you, you've kind of covered all that, especially with, with the four B's, but yeah. I will say, I, I want, I do want to add before we go that, that, uh, you and I have joked about a lot about mm -hmm. in nine, 94, um, when you were covering the work stoppage yes. in, in New York, outside the hotel, these, these num, numbskulls are meet, meeting in. And um, I li seemingly lived in the uh, lobby of the Doral Hotel. I think you lived on the street corner. Yeah, <laughs> that too. <laughs> so because you were uh, there was a poor homeless chap behind you um, down the road a little bit. And your producer may not have seen that, but uh, then walking past you and kind of says hi to the homeless uh, uh, fellow was Soupy Sales. Yeah, you remember. Oh God, yeah. And and you said, hey, you just in the middle of your sentence said, that's Soupy Sales. And and that is exactly, I want to tell you, I truly believe this, that is exactly what Vinny would have done. I, I would, again, that that's as high a compliment as you can pay. Um, again, we were doing live shots all the time. And it was a Sunday morning and, I guess we're on Park Avenue and nobody is walking by. And then all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, it's soupy sales, <laughs> you know? And it was like, how could I not? Um, and John Miller and I years ago had one of these conversations about broadcasting. And I asked John, so what, what is your, what is your overview of what it is we do, especially on radio? Just tell them what you see. Yeah. And I just happened to see Soupy Sales yeah. and White Fang and Black Tooth and <laughs> all of that walk by. That's one of those times where you're not taking yourself too seriously. It's a big score. And that's exactly what Vin Scully I would have done. And I, I'll tell you what, I uh, earlier in this little interview we're doing now, you know, you had a lot of things to say that were really interesting and heartwarming. And I had a hard time keeping it together. You know, it, it, it's such an emotional time for those of us that grew up with with Vinny. Um, and we, we lost two absolute studs in Vince Scully and, and, and Bill Russell in yeah. such a short period of time. But um, I cannot tell you how thankful we are that you came on with us tonight and uh, appreciate you taking the time and, and thank you so, so much. Bill, you know, again, we've known each other for a long time. This was a very easy get. I'm really ple I'm pleased to be with you. I truly am. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, go, go Dodgers the rest of the year. Good luck. They're pretty good. Well, great stuff there from Charlie Steiner. And we had Bob Costas a little bit earlier. Billy, great job on that interview. And now I bring in, I think I know a little bit about this guy, uh, Hall of Fame broadcaster, Ford Frick Award winner. Um, Nearly 50 years as broadcaster of the Cincinnati Reds, and I share his last name, my dad, Marty Brenneman. Dad, how you doing? I'm good. It's great to be on with you guys, you and Joe and Bill. It's a lot of fun and the night of, of remembrance, and uh, Charlie's stuff was spectacular. I was with him yesterday at Vinny's uh, funeral uh, memorial, and uh, you got a good guy in Bob Costas, and you got a good guy in Charlie, no question. Well, let me ask you, um, you, you go to the funeral uh, and, and Bob shared some of, of the names and the people that were there. And you and I spoke on the phone uh, just a couple of hours after you had left the funeral. Um, and, and I shared with the audience earlier about how, you know, it struck you that there were no celebrities that got up there and spoke like we see so many right. times, especially in a city like Los Angeles. Um, but it was all about just his family. Right. It, it was incredible. Um, the, the whole thing from the beginning until end, and, and you and I both were not Roman Catholic, but we were, I was blown away and Amanda was blown away by the taste in which this whole thing was laid out. And, you know, this was a private by invitation only, and there were 350 people there. And everywhere you turned, if it wasn't a celebrity, it was a former member of the Dodgers or Jaime Harin or people mm -hmm. like that. Peter um, O'Malley. Yes. And nobody yeah. spoke but his grandchildren, his children, and his great-grandchildren. They were the other than the two priests that conducted uh, the private. It was a high Catholic mass for burial is the way it's described to me. Uh, it, it was simply an extension 
of what Vin Scully was all about. I mean, you know, he's one of the great people I've ever known in my life. And I'm privileged to say that he and I were as close as we could be because Vinny, Vinny had a way about him that he would let you get only so close to him unless mm -hmm. you were really, truly on the inner circle. Mm -hmm. And as close as I was, I was thrilled to death to be there because the mere fact when I hung up the phone, Steve Brenner, who has been a longtime friend of mine, was a media relations director, and Billy knows him, back in the 70s, and, and, and Steve and I were dear friends, and he's back with the Dodgers in a much greater role now. And he called me at 6.30 Saturday night and said that the Scully family would like for you to be in attendance if you could be there on Monday. But we had to scurry and make plenty of reservations and fly out there. And, and Amanda said, you need to be there. And I said, I know I need to be there. If his family thought enough of me or the recommendation of someone else to ask me to come, then I needed to be there. And and it's one. it'll be one of the great memories of my lifetime because here's a guy who went to the grocery store, who went to the service station to get gas, whatever it might be when he was healthy and was able to do all of those things. And there was never a day that went by when someone didn't say, you're the greatest baseball announcer who ever lived. Yep. He had no ego. He had zero ego. And I was just impressed by the way he dealt with people, the way he dealt with me. When I came into the league in 1974, he was just a very, one of the most special people I've ever known in my lifetime. Billy, I think you know my dad a little bit. Fire away. Marty, anything how you goes, doing? Now, anything Billy, goes from now on. Well, hey, what are you up to? Oh, we lost him. Did we? Yeah, he froze up. Looks there he like. is. Yeah, he's there. Hey, you're so there. Mar Marty, um, you know you're you you've you've really dealt with because you are one of them, the great announcers uh, throughout baseball, and uh, you know I, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb here and tell and say that you're going to tell me that Vin Scully's the best of of the best. Um, but what, what is it from your point of view and, and Bob Costa shared a little bit from his point of view, what sets him apart or what set him apart professionally? Not I'm the greatest guy that ever lived, no doubt about right. it, but professionally on the air, what set him apart from everybody else? <clears throat> I, I think the biggest single thing, Bill, is the fact that he had such an eloquence and such a command of the English language and such an mm -hmm. ability to come up with a phrase at the most probable time that nobody would ever think about. And I, I tell people all the time, go back and watch a ninth inning of Sandy Koufax's perfect game. Or go back and watch his call of Kirk Gibson's home run off Dennis Eckersley. Especially that call, because he said in a season that was improbable, the impossible just occurred. Mm -hmm. Who in the hell? Would have yeah. ever thought about saying something. I mean, honest to God now. I mean, let's be honest. There are guys, yeah. unbelievably, in our profession that will not concede the fact that he's the greatest announcer in the history of baseball. If they don't, their ego is so big that they won't allow themselves to do that. But wow. to come up with a phrase like that off the top of his head, and I know it was off, it was it was a perfect phrase for the moment, and it was not planned because who in the hell would have thought that Kirk Gibson would have hit a home run on one leg off Dennis Eckersley. No, yeah. this is a thing that set him apart from everybody. Hey, Joe, yeah. hey, Joe, hey, Dad, I don't know. Joe Lips is a big Boston guy, big Red Sox fan. Joe, did you know the Reds beat the Red Sox in the World Series in 1975? I know you I weren't did. born in that. Games. I, in so, fact, I, rem I happen to know. Uh, oh, you broke up. I'm not even kidding. You broke up. Broke up, so I missed it. Joe, I said it took us seven games. It did take seven. I, I know a lot about those teams. Pat Darcy, I remember, gave up a, ge a game winner, I believe. Yeah. Um, I and believe. But, <laughs> and now the Reds won back to back world championships there, but every most, I think the average American thinks that Carlton Fisk walked off the World Series and the Red Sox won the 1975 World Series. Let me tell you something about that. We went back to the first time I'd been back to Boston since 1975 was in 2002 or 2003 when we played them in interleague play at Fenway Park. And they chose that weekend, a weekend, by the way, that the Red Sox swept the Reds. 
where they, they donate, they, they commemorated the, the right field foul pole as a Johnny Pesky foul pole and the left field foul pole as the Carlton Fisk foul pole. And mm. I said on the air the second night in, I said, if you didn't know any better, you would think that there was never a second <laughs> game to that World Series because they made <laughs> such a big deal about that. But let me make seriously make a point. The thing, and the thing I very objectively say to people, uh, it, it was one of the great World Series of all time. But people need to remember one thing. Jim Rice did not participate in that World Series because Vern Rule hit him with a pitch on the hand in September mm-hmm. in a game against the Detroit Tigers, and he was a non-participant. It would have been interesting to see how that series would have turned out had Jim Rice been active and healthy and productive like he always was that year with the Red Sox. Right, and then Yaz had to go out and play left again. Um, I, can well, I ask a general? Fine. Um, I, I wanted to say, can I ask a general question about play by play, but also maybe you could speak to Vin knowing him so well. I'm a comedian, you know, and you can feel I've done late night TV. Your heart rate is up and you're trying to perform with your heart rate up. But with a comedian, you ha- you know your jokes. With play by play, you know, it's game seven of the World Series. It's Kirk Gibson. Your heart rate has to be going up naturally as a human being. Mm-hmm. How did you personally, do you have any insight into Vin? How do you keep it, your heart rate down enough to stay in the moment and not screw up a huge moment like that? I wonder if you could mention that oh, at all. Well. All I can do is speculate, but I got to believe that Vince Scully's pulse rate was the same in the seventh inning when Gibson left the on-deck circle and went to the plate to hit as it was when the first batter stepped in to lead game seven off. I, I just – I, there was never a time that I thought Vinny lost it. And he was also a guy who was a master at shutting up television – and letting the crowd react to the people sitting in their homes or in bars or wherever they might have been watching a ball game. Uh, it, it, I, don't, I don't think his pulse ever uh, – maybe, maybe in his younger years. I think when, when uh, he uh, was broadcasting Dodger games back before they moved from Brooklyn to Los Angeles, maybe his youthful exuberance mm. might have, have carried over into maybe a, an increased pulse rate. But once he got settled – uh, I, I can't imagine his pulse rate ever jump up more than what would be normal for most human beings. You know, I got to ask you this, uh, continuing kind of in the same vein, Dad, with, with broadcasting in general. Okay, well, we've talked about Vin Scully, and everybody agrees he's the best of all time. So you, you, you put him on, on this shelf over here. Um, Correct. I, you know, and look, this is not in a disparaging way in any way, shape, or form everybody's different and everybody kind of has the guy they sort of like. Oftentimes it's your local guy, but there it, maybe it's just the style of a guy. Um, you know, I always like the style more of the Harry Carries, the Marty Brennemans, the Bob Princes of the world, where I really felt like I was sitting next to the guy at the bar because there'd be times where you'd be critical of the, of the home team's local player or critical of a decision made by the manager. Um, I, I think that those guys, guys like you, guys like Harry, uh, guys like Bob Prince, uh, are complete, gone, a breed we'll never see or hear from again in the future of sports broadcasting. You agree with that? Yes, I agree. Emphatically, I agree with that, Tom. And uh, for a lot of reasons, you know, people, it, it, I, don't, I don't put myself in the same class as the Scullys and the Bucks and the Harwells. And people like that. If other people want to put me in that class, I'm appreciative as hell. But using them as an example, all those guys were personalities. And I'm not saying this in a derogatory manner, but if you go from top to bottom of all Major League Baseball teams going today, you're not going to find too many announcers, whether they do home radio or home television, that have the kind of personalities that those guys had. These guys are more concerned with making sure that everything that comes out of their mouths doesn't incite someone who's in a position to call them on the carpet and worst case scenario, give them their pink slip. I truly believe that that guys doing big league baseball today that are relatively new or been around a while. 
there's not a damn thing they're going to say to be critical of their club. Is that taking away from a broadcast? Absolutely, without any question, it takes away from a broadcast. Now, I'm not saying hang, hammer the club. I think myself today, I put, put myself in the position of if I were doing the Reds today, and I go back to what Bob Knight's wife told him one day, the horse is dead, stop beating it. You can't <laughs> say it every night. This club, you know, you can't say that. But you can sure express an opinion when a guy doesn't run a ball out, when a guy plays a ball poorly, uh, hit into a gap or gets a bad jump on a ball. Uh, you can certainly have the freedom. And, and honest to God, I've watched a lot of baseball on television and listened on radio the last two or three years since I've retired, and I ain't heard a whole lot of criticism. Do I think that takes away from the broadcast? Absolutely, unequivocally, I think it does. Billy, I'm you know, curious you know, I, hey, hey, Bill, hey, your opinion on this, Bill, because being a former GM, I mean, you know, look, you're sitting there and you're pissed off too when your team stinks and not playing well or a guy's not running hard or whatever it is. But 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 it's the product that your your paycheck's coming from the same guy that, that, that signs Marty Brenneman's paycheck. How do you react to that as a general manager? You know, you got to have thick skin and you got to understand it's a business. And, you, you know, you have to understand you're looking for numbers. You're looking for for ratings. And and Marty, I, I, I really and I, and I know Joe does, too. Um, you know, we really appreciate the humility, but you are in the same class with with Vinny and the greats. And I know I've seen the numbers. You know, the Reds, the Reds are a small market. They're a real small market, but their radio numbers are off the charts. And I'm not they sure really if they still are. But they were when I was there, and and uh, you're a big part of that. And so I will tell you that that from my point of view, I really never that never I never cared what was being said about the club. I was worried about about the club and what's being said about the club by our announcers. I'm okay with whatever they say as long as millions of people are listening to us. You know, I you know the more we can get on board. And Marty, I, I was there. I thought, and I thought, uh, I, I usually uh, didn't. I usually heard him when the club was on on the road, because mm -hmm. when they were home, I usually was there watching the game. But you know, um, we had great great numbers. We had great fans. They can't always afford to come to the ballpark, but our radio numbers and our TV numbers were just great. And that's because Marty had him interested. And so. Do you know? Do you care much more more than that? No, we're all you know. We we get frustrated if, if the club's playing poorly, and Walt would get get pissed off if if the club's playing poorly. I I get upset. We all get upset, but we still want people to listen. We still want people to show up. And whatever you're doing, Marty, it was working because you know you had some great great numbers in a small market. And and Marty, you do you know Tom shouldn't say say this. I should say this. You do belong in that in that that tier with Vince Skelly and all, all those greats. Well, I appreciate that, Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Joe, sure. you know what? You almost grew up listening to my dad. The only oh, is that time, right? Correct me if I'm wrong here, Dad. The only time maybe you thought about leaving Cincinnati was Boston, right? I got a contract. I'm down in my basement now. The, the, every wall is filled with stuff that uh, happened in my 46-year career. And to my left on the wall is a contract written by the guy who owned the stadium station, in uh, in Boston that had the rights to the Red Sox broadcast, and he also had the rights to the Reds broadcast here in Cincinnati. And he wrote me a, on a piece of legal pad, he wrote me a five-year contract to be the voice of the Boston Red Sox back in 1981. And uh, that's as close as I ever came to leaving Cincinnati. I had offers from other clubs, but the Red Sox were the closest that uh, – that I ever came, uh, gave serious thought. At the end of the day, I figured out my act flies well in Cincinnati. It may not fly well in Boston. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. I mean, it's I'm always amazed by history like that. And uh, Joe Castiglione is now a huge part of my childhood. And He's a buddy of mine. Joe's a oh. buddy of mine. Well, I love him, and uh, I, I don't know uh, how much how more time he has. We talked about this earlier in the show. It, it's it's with these play by play guys. It's like a little piece of your childhood goes away when well, they. I, when, go to, I listened to guys back in the fifties when I was growing up in Virginia, and 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 that's that was my introduction to Major League Baseball. Not going to a game, but listening to games before I ever went to Washington D.C. with my mom and dad and my brother to see the Yankees and and the Senators play back in nineteen fifty five. And so that was my entree into the game in, in, uh, 
it was magical then. Whether it's still magical today, I don't know. But back then, in the so-called golden era of Major League Baseball, uh, it, it was a magical time for a young kid growing up in Virginia. Well, Dad, in your retirement right now, I, I would highly suggest if you've got some time to kill, because I, I have, a, I think it might win an award, is, um, is the video of Joe uh, and his day as a player uh, in the Pioneer League just a few weeks ago. Joe, would you like to share with, uh, maybe a little preview of what that might be like if, if he How'd goes that go? and picks that up? Uh, I thought it went pretty good, and um, you know, it, it's a recurring theme. They kind of the editor kind of messed me up a little bit. I mean, <laughs> he showed you know, we didn't see all the all the good stuff, and my my skipper also didn't let me show off my skills as well as it could. But I think it went pretty well. It's got over eleven, twelve thousand views now, and only a few negative comments on the internet. Give me one of the <laughs> negative comments. Yeah, Somebody well, said a, uh, yeah, example. Somebody said, make a wish is really doing great work for these young kids. <laughs> um, and somebody else made reference to my, my leg, the skin tone of my legs, but I am a city guy. What do you want? I'm not a beach guy. Would it look like you uh, were, you were painting closets? Hanging um, <laughs> <it> <laughs> paper in a closet all winter. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I fell into the chalk before they drew the baseline. <laughs> Oh, the flower pot, yeah. But I hadn't faced live pitching in 23 years. I turned around and hit from the left side and was spraying the ball. And I, I don't know many 40-year-old comedians that could have done that. No, definitely not. We don't either. <laughs> yeah. We don't know any. <laughs> but. All right, all right, that's enough. Dad, uh, thanks so much for being with us tonight. It's been great having you. And Marty, it's great seeing you. Uh, Billy, great to uh, hook up with you again and see you after yeah. a lot of years. Joe, good, you're a real talent, man. Funny as hell. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate hey, Dad, it. Dad, he's getting ready to come to Cincinnati in, in about a week and a half. Yes. you got to go out there and see him. He's going to be up in Westchester. Find out when and let me know. Is that the 19th? Is that right, Joe? Nin 19 and 20, I think. Next Friday okay. and well, we got to get up there. Your big party, your big 80th birthday party is on the 20th, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we got to get out yeah. there the 19th and see Joe. Yeah, come on out. Pre-game. All right, pal. <laughs> All right, we'll see you later. All right. Thanks, thanks Marty. Marty. All right, thanks, Dad. Thanks. Love you. See you later on. All right. Now, yeah, he just turned 80 and was over in uh, Ireland for uh, a couple of weeks and um, and just got back over there teeing him up a little bit. Wow. You know, when he was uh, – he was – I think it was the late 70s when John McNamara was the manager there. Yeah, after Sparky, yeah. And he was the manager in San Diego when I was a kid. And then when I was on, on the grounds crew there, I, I actually became real close with John. Great guy. And, and I knew him before his son, before I knew his son. His son en ended up being my roommate in college. And um, when the Reds came into San Diego one time, he showed up for our school because uh, in college because um, – Mike, his son, had John's golf clubs in his trunk, in the trunk of his car. And so I don't know how he did it, but John tracked us down. He tracked us down in, in class, actually. And he and he he cut he came to the back door and I would I had my head against the wall <laughs> as asleep. <laughs> and all I heard is, what the f <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I look, there's John McNamara. Yeah. And so then the next three days we're driving around. Shut, you know, chauffeuring John McNamara and Marty Brenneman and jo Johnny Bench and Tom Seaver yeah, in Mike's old there. 55 Ford. But they had a real good team. They were, they were just fun to watch. And your dad was a hoot, man. He was just a oh, good yeah. guy. He, he's he was, a he was such dude. a good I mean, and when I was, you know, I'm, I'm, you're there. So, but I'm telling you, in C Cincinnati, it was Nick Crawl who pointed that out to me. He said, he said, you know, we do have fans here. He said, you know, we, they just can't always afford to come, come to the ballpark. He said, but look at Marty's numbers. Yeah. yeah and he was the one who showed him. They were, they were just off the charts. Mm -hmm. Marty's numbers, mm -hmm. you know, the Reds' numbers were just nuts. Yeah. So I, I, I do know that he's, he's one of the greats uh, without a doubt. And that, that's way better coming out of my mouth than yours. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, our final angle to sort of tie a ribbon around this whole Vin Scully thing is tonight. Everybody remembers uh, Don Sutton. Hall of Fame pitcher, an awesome guy. I, I, I love Don Sutton. Uh, his son, Darren, who has gone on to have a great broadcasting career, 
Um, comes at it, the Vince Scully angle, a little bit different. Similar in some ways to Bill Bavese because he, he grew up listening to him all the time. But, but Darren got to meet him from being around his dad a little bit. And, Billy, you had a chance to visit with Darren Sutton uh, a little bit earlier today. Hey, hey uh, Tom, we're lucky enough to have Darren Sutton here with us, a uh, longtime uh, announcer for uh, many ma major league clubs. He's now doing work for Perfect Game TV. Um, he is a personal friend of mine. He played for the Angels when I was the farm director there, uh, while uh, just after his father was playing for the Angels and uh, his father, Don Sutton. And we've got Darren here, we're, and we're lucky to have you. I appreciate you coming on, Darren. Uh, thank you, my friend. This is an honor to talk about this subject. Well, the subject is Vin Scully, and really it's just the greatness of Vin Scully. And it's, I'm just going to ask you a free flowing question question but before I do that I gotta say you and I have I believe real similar situations I'm, I'm quite a bit older than you but I think maybe coming along through Los Angeles I might have been just years ahead of you and then An Anaheim years ahead of you and then into into baseball professionally may maybe a few years ahead of you um, but Vin Scully's voice was always in our home and whenever I heard I mean, listen, man, I've, I've heard some great announcers, including your dad, including you, including John, John Miller, including, I mean, I can go down a long list, right? But every time I hear a game and I hear their voices, Vince Scully's voice is going into my head. And um, his, his, his voice was like music in our household. Was it similar to, for, for you? Yeah, very much so. And, and, and at multiple layers, right? So just, yeah, just being a little bit younger than you, you know, when you talk about my dad's years, that was, you know, to where I can recall it, at least was like 74 to, to, to 80, right? So 74 to 80 were my ages when I could, you know, was old enough to understand it. And obviously, you know, Vin had six decades, almost seven decades, but you know, it was a good Dodgers decade. They were really good. And as I started to understand the game, not only was Vinny in the seats every night with the transistor radios, you could hear the storytelling because everyone, and it was accepted. There was no noise pollution when it was Vin Scully. And I think that's important to understand. Like people brought their radios in transistor, all you youngins out there, you could listen to your radio in your hand and um, you could hear Vin's voice throughout the ballpark describing the players, the action. And then when I'd go home, because I couldn't always stay late, I was a kid, right? I had to go home. Um, you know, I'd listen to my room. I could listen, you know, it, it's, it sounds like, you know, we're being old men about it, but it's just logic. You could listen kind of by your bedside. It wasn't always under my pillow because I didn't have to sneak baseball. My mom let me listen to baseball. Um, so yeah, and it was a peaceful voice. It was a descriptive voice. It was one that inspired me to, to uh, along with his his dear friend and partner Ross Porter. It, it was one that inspired me to to do what I've been lucky enough to do for a long time. You know, uh, your your dad is is uh, one of the greatest pitchers that ever ever lived, and and uh, hall hall of famer, and you know, a great play by play guy, great color guy, also. Um, so when does this strike you? Because, you know, you were, uh, when I was the farm director in Anaheim, you were playing. Uh, so when does this strike you that, Hey, I want to, I want to call this, I want to call this game. Oh, and, and with Vin and Ross's inspiration, it started to strike me very young. I mean, honestly, like the playing part of it, um, was wonderful and unforgettable, but you read my reports. There was a lot of effort and, and, and try hard, but there was very little to no skill. I, I think the baseball came because I was a legacy, right? And and so I was honored to get a chance to play as long as I could minor league baseball, but I was very logical about the fact of what I saw around me. We're all players much, much more better, better skilled than I. So uh, even through high school, when people would play varsity basketball, I did the PA for varsity basketball. When I was in college, when I played college baseball, I did the PA for the other sports around campus. I'd MC dinners on campus for academic groups. And I think being around the greatness of broadcasting, you know, by, like you say, by osmosis, I just craved it. I loved it. I did see Vinny's preparation. I did see Ross's preparation. We're, we're glad Ross is still with us, by the way. Um, but it was it was that that kind of really rubbed off on me, and then I just kept honing it and honing it. But it it happened pretty young that I wanted to get behind a microphone. Well, it's it's real nice you bring up Ross. Uh, what a nice person, what a good 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 guy. But I'm going to go back to Vinny for a second and and about his preparation. What um, is there anything unique about his preparation? Anything you can share with you know we got we involved in the Pioneer League. We have the uh, the Syracuse University. Uh, Newhouse School of Communications, a real prestigious program. Uh, we yeah. have a 
few interns from, from there. So we have a lot of those kids listening to this. And, and is there anything in particular about Vinny's preparation? Very vividly. I, I remember he built the internet before there was the internet. In other words, mm -hmm. he would get multiple papers from multiple sources from around the country delivered. And, uh, you know, by the end of his time, or even by the middle of his time, he had a staff that worked with him to do it. He had earned that. He didn't have a color analyst. So, you know, uh, Boyd, who was with him, his right-hand man, helped him in his research as well. But he would basically read and gather stories almost like we were clicking, you and I on our smartphones or the young broadcasters you're talking about, you know, a great note or a great personal story about a player. That, that, that piece would be cut out. It would be saved. Uh, you know, whether it was glued, stapled, I don't know how, how he got it to that point, but he read multiple um, newspapers um, and then organized the, the stories about the players or about the team that fit over that broadcasting of, of the upcoming broadcast. I, I oftentimes walk in and, and watch him getting organized in that sense, um, you know, with regard to the stories about the players, with regard to the note. So he kind of built the internet before there was the internet, if you follow me there. He, he went out and got all the resources, gathered them together, and then was ready for each game. The baseball party lived, so that part wasn't difficult. The, the tedious part that all of us game callers do, the batting average, home runs, RBIs, now we put in some more modern stats, that part he could have done in his sleep. And the describing of the game, he could have done in his sleep. It was inherently part of him. But then the storytelling, the research he did, and then the team that he had with him, you know, in the second half of his career that helped him do the research. And you could even say all the research that he partnered to do with his team later in his career, you can have everything you want. And honestly, us modern broadcasters do. You can have everything you want at your fingertips. But when do you put it in? When do you insert it into the game? When does it fit? There was no one better, A, at researching, and then with his team later in his career researching, and then B, figuring out where it fit. He was masterful at that. Huh. Yeah, those are, those are all great points. And I, I have kind of a, a strange one here. Um, you know, Vinny influenced you as, as, a, as a broadcaster, but is there anything non-broadcasting you know, outside your profession that you, that you think he may have influenced? um personally uh just maybe your attitude or how, how you go about work or just just anything that's an easy one uh the handwritten letter the handwritten thank you letter i mean to the to his final days when vin scully was a part of anything or someone took the time to meet him if he had a way of contacting you and again when you become a legend you can have a team of people help you uh, Vin had no problem on his stationary card writing a handwritten letter. And it's a touch of class that I watched as a younger person. Um, and, and then beyond that, how he treated people, how he took time, whether I was a major league announcer and quote unquote his colleague, or whether I was a kid of a major leaguer, he always had a genuine kindness uh, towards everyone that approached him. He'd protect his privacy when he was preparing, as he should have, because he was a rock star, like we still see Bob Euchre in Milwaukee. It's hard for those guys. It's hard for those guys to pre prepare for a game because they're almost like a museum piece. So it's two things. When he did have the time for you, it was always genuine. And, and most importantly, it's a simple thing, like you said, and that's what you're asking for. The handwritten thank you note right here uh, in this little tiny audio Olympus that I'm about to dump it in and edit it. It's old school audio, right? About, I don't know, probably 12, 14 years ago, I did a, a long interview with Vinny. When I came the next day to sit down in the Diamondbacks broadcast booth, there was just a simple note card. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk Dodgers baseball with me. I enjoyed our conversation. Um, I'm glad to, you know, something to the effect, I'm glad to, to hearken back to the days that mean the, the most to both of us. It was sitting right there where I was about to call the game. Vinny had written it to me. It's unbelievable. What, what a guy. It's crazy. I tell you, I, 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 my, my takeaway was I just remember him, you know, he had, uh, he, he, like, like most people, there's always a bump and a bruise in, in life somewhere along, along the way. And he, he got his share and, but For his sure. attitude was a choice. You know, he just, you could tell this guy had just chosen to be, to have the outlook he had, which was so positive, so kind. Uh, so I, I really appreciate, you know, your, your sharing that with us. Cause that's, I never thought of that. I never thought about that, uh, the hand handwritten note, but that's, that's, that's spectacular. And, and, you know, I want to tell you that it's, um, it's heartwarming to see, you know, just how successful you've been and you're choosing to do things you want to do. You know, the, the work you're doing now, it's a choice of yours. And uh, I love watching your work and I love, love your professionalism. You must've got, a lot of that, uh, a lot of this uh, Vinnyisms came through your dad too. 
Is there some of that, you know, in, in influence from, from your father in the booth also? Oh, for sure. A lot of that's just about work ethic, right? I mean, that's the same probably that you would say about your family ties. I mean, a lot of it is work ethic and it doesn't really matter if your father is an excellent craftsman, is an excellent school teacher, you know, is an excellent taxi cab driver. Mine just happened to be an excellent baseball player. Um, and then he transitioned into to broadcasting. A lot of it comes from him and, and just knowing how to handle yourself around those moments, knowing how to how to, you know, just a few minutes ago, we interviewed a major league center fielder who's still a baby, but, you know, we interviewed Riley Green, who's in the center center field spot for the Tigers. And, um, you know, just understanding how to relate to those athletes. I'm fortunate. My dad brought me to work a lot. I mean, a real lot. That was kind of my method of punishment if I got in trouble for back talking or getting bad grades is that I couldn't go to the ballpark. And so it worked. And so for me, really what he passed along to me was inclusion and the understanding when I got at 29, 30 to the, to the, the dream job of being a major league announcer that it, I knew how to handle myself. I wasn't always perfect, but within that locker room, I knew how to handle myself. I knew kind of the questions to ask. I knew, you know, how to pay attention. I knew my place. And, um, and so for me, I'll always thank my dad for being inclusive of me, you know, because uh, he didn't have to be, you know, he was loving when he came home, you know, he was a good dad. It was a travel job. I got that part, but he was very inclusive and allowed me to kind of understand how it all ticks. Well, when it comes to Darren Sutton, uh, Vin Scully, and especially Don Sutton, did a great job. You're fabulous. You do a great job. And listen, man, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. This is a cool thing you guys are doing. Thanks for letting me help out. All right. Be well. It's great stuff, Billy. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and good yeah, to see he's, Darren he's again. Good guy. Yeah, he's really a good, good guy. guy. Yeah. Hey, before you, hey, before you get off the uh, Vinny topic, I, I do want to point out one thing. You yep. notice uh, Vinny had four Bs and Harry Carey had four Bs. They're a little different, though, huh? A little <laughs> different. You got that right. You got that right. And I think it was your dad, or it might have been Bob, that, that was talking about the postscript and the things. Vinny would have these these sayings that just wow. they, they seem to come, come to life. And I noticed I had never heard this uh, before in the Don Larson bit. Yeah. Uh, when he was when he, when he was calling that, and he and he referred to it as the biggest diamond in the biggest ring. Yeah. This this guy hadn't even hit thirty years old. I don't think no, yet. And, no. and I mean, just it, remarkable. He was just so well read. I mean, you know, I, I was around him so frequently. I was announcing for you know over a dozen years in in the same division with the Diamondbacks, and um, you know Darren shared some of that, and that and that's exactly yeah. the way he was, and. Um, you know, he, he, Boyd, who he, he made reference to, would, would would help gather a lot of the information, uh, and 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 Vinny and the stuff that he was doing as well. But you know, Bob talked a lot about preparation, and there's no doubt. Uh, you know, uh, you, if you want to be one of the best, the preparation in any walk of life, it doesn't matter what it is, and you can tell by the guys when you watch them who's really preparing and who's just kind of getting by. And, and and there are games where I don't care who you are, you, you you're gonna just. You, might be because your team got in at four o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning. And that next day, the first day of the series against the Marlins on a July night, you, you may not be quite as on it, but it's, you know, like anything else, it's also about the execution. Yeah. And I think that's the one word I remember and, and whether people like him or not, I could care less. It doesn't matter to me because I, I, I like the guy I got along fine with him was Kurt Schilling uh, in the years he was in Arizona. And he always used to just talk about execution. And, um, you know, Vinny and these guys we've talked to tonight, they execute when it matters, just like athletes. Joe, just like a comedian. I mean, you know, 10 guys can tell the same joke, but who executes it the best, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same thing, and it's it's preparation and being relaxed. It's very similar to me. Is you got to have uh, prepared, you got to be ready for it, but you also have to be ready to uh, make things up as they go along. And um, and as, as as a dual sport athlete, baseball and comedy, you know, it's I really got to be on my toes. <laughs> And a pretty good journalist, too. I think we have a piece. There's coming. no question. And we're getting to that. Swear and ask questions about myself. Strength. We're getting to that right now. Because <laughs> we're going to shift gears a little bit and, and get back into some Pioneer Lake baseball. Because, uh, Joe, you had a chance to talk to your teammate. And I love this guy when we came out to Missoula. Jason Newman. He, he's the Otani of the Pioneer League. He hits home runs. And he comes in to close the game. Uh, for the Paddleheads, but he just broke a 60-year-old Pioneer League record 
with his 27th home run in just 65 games. And so, Joe, you know, your main man, you know, some of your juice sort of rubbed off on his bat. There's no doubt about it. Here you are with Mr. Newman. Hey, I'm here with Jason Newman. What's up, Jason? Good to see you, man. Nice to see you, too. Long time no see. I know. Do you, I mean, first, I mean, every question I have is related to me. I'm a very selfish journalist. Does the team miss me? Do you feel that the, the, the morale is low? Uh, not so low, but we may need another sighting soon just to, just to get it back up right before playoffs. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate you humoring me there. Now, I, I got to ask, because a lot of people have been asking me, if, if Missoula, knock on wood, I know it's a superstitious sport, if you're able to win the title, do I get a ring? That's not my call. I'm not going <laughs> to say yes or no, but, you know, you did help out for a game or two. I was on the team. I mean, first base coach, two triples. Um, but anyways, let's get to, you just set, the single season home run record for the pioneer baseball league. Is that correct? Am I getting this info right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I mean, how do you feel? Are you, do you, does this, are you riding this high? Do you walk around with a little bit extra, an extra inch or do you not really care? And you're just focused on the game. Uh, you know, I try and focus on the game. It's obviously a great accomplishment, uh, for myself, um, for the team, you know, being able to be in that position, um, you know, I'm sure once the season's done and I'll be able to reflect more on, you know, what an incredible year it was just all, all around. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a great accomplishment. Yeah. It's awesome, man. It's really exciting. And I, I want to ask too, is like, when, when's the, what's the earliest seedling that you might hold a, a lot of balls. I think I could break this record. Or was it just a couple of weeks ago, someone says to you, hey, by the way, you're three home runs away? Um, I never really thought about it. Um, it was kind of one of those things that just came up um, in terms of, you know, like, you know, in terms of the home run count. Uh, you know, I never was chasing that. It was just kind of one of those things that, you know, I guess fell into the lap. Right. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm proud to uh, be your teammate, former teammate, whatever it is. But I got to ask about your stroke because I, I was out in the outfield shagging fly ball or attempting to shag fly balls. I didn't touch any. But when you were at BP, I said to whoever was next to me, I think it was Dan Sway, I go, is this guy on the team? You, it looked like you were just effortlessly spraying the ball around. It looked like you were barely trying. What do you credit that – power to is it just lifting or is it your is it your stroke what is it uh you know a lot of good food over the years have helped uh you know my family was in the restaurant business so that um you know i credit also a lot of it to just a lot of my former teammates um you know guys like zach allman last year um the previous holder um guys who i trained with in the off season uh, something that helped me was just actually talking about my swing, knowing what, if I can teach it, that means I know what I'm trying to do. So vocalizing that has really helped me, um, especially this off season. And then hitting with a bunch of um, guys who are at places that I want to be at um, and seeing how they react to the way I hit has given me a lot of confidence. Yeah, you make it look effortless. I know it isn't, but, and you're also a guy, I think you commented this to me uh, at the game that you said, everyone thinks you got it. When you get a piece of it, it feels like everyone thinks you Homer. Cause I was at first base, a first base coach and you hit one and like a jackass, I threw both hands in the air and uh, it, I don't even know if it hit the warning track. I, I had a misjudgment, but it, it feels like you're one of those guys. that feels like people think you're going to hit one out. And so when you get a piece of it, it feels like it's flying out. I don't know if that's a question, but maybe you can comment on that. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, you always want to put a good swing on the baseball. Um, you know, sometimes I do it. Sometimes I don't. It's, it's baseball. It's one of those things. Yeah. It's very exciting. And that's the number one skill. I've always, I, I've always had this debate with people. Would you want to be able to dunk a basketball or hit a home run in baseball? And, and I'm always been a baseball. I'm more of a baseball guy in general, but what does that really feel? 
gone. And you're wa- are you watching it the whole way? Take us through a, a good home run stroke. There's nothing like it. Uh, you know, just a solid contact where the bat, you know, doesn't move. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And that's what we all love about the game is finding the little things that we find to be so beautiful. And, you know, a home run is just a great thing. So. Yeah, it's the best. Now I'm a, I'm a frequent uh, goer to of games. What? I go to games a lot and I've been that this asshole who the person, the, the hitter connects and I jump up and go, Oh, and then it's just not gone. It's off the wall or it's cut. Have you had the embarrassing moment in baseball where you do a bat flip or you walk and then it's caught at the wall or it's a, or it ends up being a single. Cause you just were strolling. Um, yeah, there's been some times where that's, uh, you know, kind of hit, I feel my bad and disappointment because I just missed it. Um, and then, you know, there's sometimes where you, like, I don't like to bat flip. I, I have done it more this year than any time previous in my life. Um, but, you know, I'll hit it. And if it's kind of questionable, I'll stand there for a second, but then it's, it's time to focus and run. So I, I really don't like to do that. Um, you know, I, I understand that the game's changing and you like to have fun and um, some guys do it. Some guys don't. I've, I've done it more this year, like I said, than any other year, but yeah, it's just not part of my game. Yeah. I don't care for the bat. I'm, I'm from the eighties. I'm 58 years old. I like a good old fashioned, you know, shake hands and trot around, but I, I gotta ask, we're, we're going to run out of time. They're going to yell at me. I, we, I always go long, but, you're also closing games, which I didn't get to see. You, you go, you take the hill, you close the game out. And when I was at the game in the stands, the guy behind me was actually rooting for the other team to score because he wanted to see you on the mound. Uh, tell us a little bit about you're playing the field, you're hitting home runs, and then you have to switch into the mode of I might have to pitch. What is that like? Uh, you know, it's Skip has a thing that he calls me the undertaker. Um, so it's just one of those things that I, personally, I flip a switch when I'm going into the game to pitch. So, uh, you know, no trade secrets are being given away, but it's, it's just something mental for me. Um, balls in my hands. Um, and we need, we need a clean inning. So, you know, just got to do the job. All right. Would you rather have an immaculate inning on the mound or hit three home runs at the plate? You can't have both. Uh, I have had three home runs in a game before, so I would love an immaculate inning. I mean, I, I would like to see that too. I, I, I got to get back out there. And I had one more question. I don't know if you remember this because we edited the video. Jackson was editing this video of my day at the ballpark. You gave me a bat. No one wanted to give me their bat. I hope I did it proud. I, I, I had some good, good pieces. You said something that looked very threatening in the video. Do you remember what you said to me when you gave me that bat? No, but what I do remember was I was obviously I'm on the field. I'm probably one of the bigger guys you've seen around. So, you know, I kind of wanted to scare you a little bit uh, just just for fun. But, you know, it was it was just a fun thing that, you know, when you were running around the outfield, I yelled, come on, like catch it or something. And when the field was quiet and then, you know, hitting and then it was just it was all fun. Oh, I was terrified the whole time. And, uh, and I also was told I should wear a helmet in the outfield, which hurt my feelings. And then every time the ball got about 10 feet away, I, I shit my pants and thought, what if I take this off the dome? But we just want safety for you. Yeah, I appreciate that. But I feel like I did okay in the cage. I popped a couple up, grounded a few out, swung and missed it one. But I really stroked a couple pretty good and uh, had an opposite field piece too. It's all in the video. It's all there for the evidence. Go check it out on YouTube. Jason, thanks so much for having me and taking the time out. And congratulations and, uh, and keep kicking ass. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to see you, man. Thank you. You keep getting back to the editing. <laughs> First of all, I mean, little... it, it doesn't matter if it's live, if it's with my dad, if it's with Costas, is it with, with Newman. I mean, it always comes back to the, to the editing. I think I just think he did me dirty, Jackson. Uh, I don't know. He's got it out for me. But what a what a crap interview. I, my internet was cutting out. I said stroke eleven times. It's like I had a stroke, and then I, I swore. I said a hole. That was just oh, terrible. Wow. 
No, it wasn't. He's a great dude. Yeah, it was great good. Guy. It was good. It was good. Yeah. Great guy. He really did, by the way. I thought it. I, I thought he was like another guy embedded with the team when he was swinging. He was barely swinging. They're all just flying yeah. over the fence. I mean, they I, people have told me on a serious note, Billy, I'm curious. Yeah, I, I mean, when we first went out there, um, there are a lot of people that believe that he could hit minor league pitching. I mean, or very high level minor league pitching right now. The problem has been for him is finding him a position to play, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, mean, I have, I haven't seen him, but that's, that's the story, but yeah. um, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll probably get an opportunity. I don't know. I don't, uh, so. he, I don't know how, how old he is. He's not, <laughs> it's a young, young league. Yeah. So he, he's probably one, one of the older kids, but you know, this fella uh, has to get lucky, you know, for somebody to pick him up. He has to get lucky. And that can happen, you know, when, when, a, when a scout or somebody goes through there or talks to the, to the Missoula club, you know, you're looking to fill some spots for spring training some, sometimes. And, mm-hmm. and I doubt anybody at Missoula thought they're going to get 27 home, home runs and a bunch of saves out of this guy, yeah. right? So – Things happen. You, you know, you get lucky. And sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. So yeah. ho- hopefully that's what's going to happen for him. Well, speaking of PBL home run benches, the Glacier Range Riders, Brody Wofford. You talk about making some noise now. He set an old, old Pioneer League record, hitting eight home runs in eight games. And our PBL Director of Baseball Administration, Aaron Bond, had a chance to catch up with him yesterday. How you doing today? Doing good, brother. How you doing? Doing real good, man. I like the flow, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. Dude, congrats on being the player of the week. You freaking lit it up this week, this past week. Thanks, man. Yeah, it felt good to kind of turn it around and try to get a couple wins for the team this week. So it was good. Yeah, I just got to read off your stat line real quick. In six games, you hit 381, 11 RBIs, five runs, four home runs, and one grand slam. And one thing that you don't know, you're actually on a eight – you actually had uh, eight home runs in the last eight games for a lot of people that don't know. Dude, tell me about that. That's freaking amazing. Yeah, I just – I was seeing the ball. I uh, I would got with my hitting coach, uh, Stu Peterson, and we were just trying to figure out some way to try to generate more power and just try to produce more runs for the team. And we decided on – just trying to get a higher leg kick, just to kind of see the ball a little bit more. Um, Help me adjust to pitches because I was swinging a lot of sliders down and I wasn't getting the ball, you know, up in the zone and working on that and working on my direction. And then just all kind of clicked and they all kind of came in bunches. So, you know, I appreciate him for helping me, you know, make that adjustment and do that with my swing. So That's huge. I know Peterson's a really good, really smart guy. I'm, you know, in baseball, it's like dominoes. You get one, you know, it starts to, oh, it yeah. just starts to flow. Oh yeah, it just. I'm not a huge home run guy. I never really have been, but when I do hit them, they do come in spurts. And uh, yeah, I've never had a week like this in my life, or I guess the last two weeks. So it's yeah, been kind of right. You have 15 home runs, but you don't hit a home runs like that. Did I see that right? You got 15 home runs. Yeah, I mean, I hit seven home runs in the first half, and that's whatever forty some games, and I think I've I have more than that, and I don't know, eleven games or something like that. It's it's ridiculous. I have no idea what's going on right now. Yeah. Oh man, was there any like key adjustments that you did? I know you say you worked on a higher leg kick, um, worked on timing a little bit, just trying to see the ball up. Was there anything else with you that you worked on? I mean just direction with my back tip. But honestly, man, like, I, I mean, I've been telling everybody, everybody's asking, like, you know, what's going on? What are you doing? I've never really had a big leg kick. And for some weird reason, it has just made my rhythm all synced up. You know, everything's just flowing rhythm. I mean, you know how it is. You can wake up tomorrow and that rhythm's just gone, you know? Yeah. So you've kind of got to ride that wave as long as you can. And uh just going to keep riding it, you know, keep picking it up and just letting it fly. That's all you can do. Leg high, let it fly. That's it, baby. Hey, so I, I saw this is your third year in, in pro ball. You had two years prior in the Frontier League and mm-hmm. this year in the Pioneer League. Like, and 
the first two years you were kind of like just uh, like struggling a little bit and this year you you have been absolutely amazing for your team you've been there an entire year you've been producing runs playing great defense like is it was there any difference in your between your first two years and now i would say the biggest thing is just like the preparation throughout the whole year um I remember my first couple of years in the frontier, you know, I had a pretty decent first half. And then the second half, I really fell off and would have that one bad month that really kind of made the whole season look terrible. And I'm trying now to just keep getting that sleep, keep going to the gym, uh, keep trying to eat as good as I can just to keep the body well and the mind well for the entire season. And I think that's been the biggest adjustment. And uh, just not wasting at bats, you know. Every day, just go out there and just try to take advantage of every opportunity. That's great. You can't let one of bad slip away. Nah, they start piling on, man. Oh, they do. It's, 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 it's hard like to stay locked ball. in for, you know, 20 to 30 pitches a night. It's unreal, especially when you're playing every day. Yeah. You know how. Got to love the grind, though. Got to love it. Oh, got to re- gotta respect it and got to love it. That's for sure. So, Brody, favorite pregame meal? Where's the one place you go every single day before your games just to get you get yourself ready, lock the loader for the game? I got to go with Chick-fil-A, man. I go with two spicy chicken sandwiches, large fry, and a sweet tea. That's me right there. <laughs> That's and where the power is coming I, from right there. Exactly. Then I crush my little 45-minute pregame nap, and I'm ready to roll. That's it. I know you Georgia guys love them sweet teas, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's like our Coca-Cola right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Brody, man, I got two fan questions for you, man. They're pretty They're pretty wacky, but I think they're actually really funny. You ready? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Are boneless chicken wings just chicken nuggets in disguise? I would have to say yeah, because my girlfriend always says that. <laughs> so I'm going to have to go with her. She's smart. So I would have to say yeah, they are definitely. I don't disagree with that comment at all. All right, yeah, second that's a good one. Question. If you're at a restaurant and your waiter doesn't come back, are you the waiter? Mm, that is a wacky one. I would probably <laughs> have to say, I have to say, yeah, too. You are waiting on the waiter, so yeah, you're definitely the waiter. Yeah, that's I think you become the waiter at that point. Yeah, I would think so too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's a good question. Well, Brody, thanks again for taking time out, man. Go ahead, have a go ahead, get some Chick Fil A, man. Get your little pregame nap in, and yes, keep sir. keep killing the ball, man. Keep leg high, let it fly, man. Keep killing the ball. Keep doing you. That's it, man. I appreciate y'all, man. Uh, thanks for everything you guys do. It means a lot, so I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Congrats again. It's good stuff. Really good stuff. And um, you know, Billy, we want to want to thank you. I know we did last week, uh, but. I want to thank you again uh, and the Baseball Bureau Scout School for stepping up to sponsor uh, the Roundup Show here. We had Bob Fontaine Jr. on the program a couple of weeks ago. And one thing we're going to do every week is the scouting tip of the week. So here is Bob Fontaine Jr. with this week's scouting tip of the week. Hey, we've got uh, Bob Fontaine here, uh, part of the Baseball Bureau Scout School. And actually, it's, it's his, the Baseball Bureau Scout School. Uh, we both uh, operate and run this, and we enjoy it. Bob, today, we're going to try to tempt people to sign up by giving them a little teaser with the Scout School Tip of the Week. What do you got? Well, I think today we're going to hit a little bit, no pun intended, on hitting. Um, like we discussed uh, last time, you know, um, with pitching, there's a lot of similarities between the two that people don't realize. There's certain things you need to look at uh, when a player, uh, you know, is hitting as well as when they're pitching. And, and basically what we do is we take a look from the bottom up, from the feet on up to the hands and to the head, because those things need to be doing the right thing in order to have the maximum success. Um, Hitting and pitching are the two subjects that people talk about the most uh, because there's a lot of things to talk about. Plus, that's where they have most of their interest. And and the thing that's so good about it, Bill, you and I have been running these kind of schools now for almost 10 years. Every year we hear a new thought. We hear a, a new approach that we didn't even know. 
And, and sometimes it's so simple, you say to yourself, why didn't I think about that? But it's not that simple. And when you look at a hitter, it's very important that you can see everything that's happening from the, the feet to the body, to the hands, and to the start and finish of a swing. And it's so important that you see that from the side, the open side, not behind home plate. You can't pick up everything that's happening behind home plate. You can't see the different ways the body may shift or the hands may shift. So it's very important that, that you look at that. And this is the kind of thing that we just go in depth on. And I, and I will tell you one thing, and I'll make it short, but when you talk like we talk in this school and you pick up these different things you'll be able to watch a game on tv and a hitter may be struggling and chances are you may be able to figure out why they're struggling or when they're zoned in and everything is going right you'll be able to see hey he does all of this right that's why he's having so much success so this is a lot to talk about but it's something we all enjoy and hopefully uh you will enjoy as well. So uh, last week, I think we talked about uh, the best place you like to watch pitching from is from behind the pitcher on the closed side, not behind the right. plane, not on the open side with the pitcher in front of you. So with the hitter, it's just the opposite. You want right. to be you want to be looking at his open side. You want to see him. You want to see his face. You want to see his belt belt buckle. You want to see the front of him. You don't want the closed side or behind the plate, right? That is correct, because when you have the open side with a hitter, you can see every part of the body. But most importantly, from the side, the open side, you can see how the hands start. You can't always see that from behind. And so you're you're right, Bill. It's just the opposite of a pitch. All right. So that's uh, the Baseball Bureau's Scout School Tip of the Week. Thanks, Bob. Talk to you later. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Yeah. Great stuff, Billy. Thank you, Bob, very much. This is a good time now to go to our famed comedian and commentator. You know him, you love him, Will Durst for Who's on Durst. Hey, guys. Will Durst here talking to you about the calendar. September, right around the corner. And I'm telling you that all year long, I tell people when they get excited about the Giants or they get depressed about the Giants, oh, man, they look great. They suck. I always tell them the same thing. It's all about September. Because it is. You got to come into the playoffs hot. You need momentum. In the year 2007, the Denver Rockies or Colorado Rockies or whatever they are, a team that plays way high. They won 14 of their last 15 regular season games. And then they won their first two playoff series, sweeping Philadelphia and then Arizona for the NLCS. They won the National League pennant and their ticket in the World Series. But then they had to wait and sit around for the Boston Red Sox to win the AL. By the time they came back to play, they had lost all of their momentum and got swept four games to zero. So it's all about September. Don't give up. Hope springs eternal. And it's summer's well, too. And then, of course, in September, once you make the playoffs, it's all about October. Talk to Reggie Jackson about that. Or the San Francisco Giants in the year 2010, 2012, and 2014. And this is 22, another even year, so you never know. Because sometimes a team has all the parts they need to win. They just haven't gelled. And it takes time for the gel to bring everybody together. And you'll hear teams talk about that after they win, that the chemistry just fell, fell together. So hope springs eternal. And it's summer as well, too. So have a good September, win a couple in a row, or 14 out of 15. That'll help. It'll help everybody, except Arizona. For the Pioneer Baseball League Roundup, I'm Will Durst. And happy baseball, everybody.
All right, good stuff there, Will. Thank you very much. And, and he's right about September. I mean, you know, look, you got to be in a position to put yourself um, it, 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 within striking distance, right? But, man, there have been just some under – just look the last year in September. I mean, what happened? All of a sudden, the Cardinals come out of nowhere. What did they rip off? 15, 16, 17 in a row, something like that? It happens. Yeah. It's the best time of the year. It's the most fun, most fun time of the year if you're in it. It's yeah. the worst time of the year if you're not in it. There's no, <laughs> there's no. Your Red Sox aren't going to be in it, are they, Joe? Boy, I don't think so. Uh, it really came apart. Chris Sale fell off a bike or a scooter. I don't know what the heck's going on. But in June, it felt like they were going to be there. But yeah. that 07 team was fun. <laughs> Jeez. That was seven. Good Lord. All right. Let's uh, zero in on tonight's games around the Pioneer League. Uh, and you can uh, check out any of the games you want. Watch your favorite teams by going to pioneerleague.com or any of the uh, PBL team websites to access the games tonight. So here we go. Our guys from Syracuse University getting this uh, ready for game time. Let's start with our buddy Hayden, who's still hanging out in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to tell us what's going on with Billings and Idaho Falls. Hey, Hayden, what's happening, man? Not much. All right. So Billings is 34 and 31 in the season, while the Chuckers are 38 and 29. Now, despite both having winning records, they're actually third and fourth uh, in the North Division, respectively. Billings being third, Idaho Falls being fourth. But both are five and five in their last 10. Uh, the Mustangs took the first of this six game set uh, by a score of three to two last night. Now, Patrick Maybach is on the bump tonight for the Mustangs. He started three games this season and holds a 6 3 9 ERA, but he had his best start of the season last time out against the Glacier Range Riders, throwing five and a third innings of shutout ball on the way to his first win of the year. Um, for Billings, the hitter to watch today is Gabe Wirtz, who's tied for third in the league in home runs with 16, and he has a slugging percentage of 602, which is ridiculously good. And as for the Chuckers, Jack Desenso is making his 13th start. He's 4-4 four and four with a 5.79 ERA. He's also had his possibly his best outing of the year last time out as well, going seven innings, only giving up two runs, um, on the way to a win over the Boise Hawks. Now, one hitter to watch today is Brandon Bonning. Uh, he's making his Chuckers debut and playing second base today, so hopefully he can get on the board. Hey, did you get a haircut? No, I took a shower, Tom. That's what happens. Everyone asks me that question. <laughs> What's All a right. shower? A shower. A Couldn't shower. Tell you. You're looking good, Hayden. You're looking good. Appreciate it, man. Good Thank to see you, you as always. All right, Austin, uh, with uh, Rocky Mountain at Ogden. You're also going to bring us up to date, Austin, on uh, Grand Junction in Northern Colorado. How you doing, Austin? I'm good. How you guys doing? Good. Did you shower today? I did shower today, but that was this morning, so no wet hair for me. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so away. we have a battle. Yeah, I got it. Uh, it's a battle in the middle of the South Division tonight as the Vibes visit the Raptors. Rocky Mountain did well last week to bounce back from a 4-8 and eight start to the half, winning 4-6 of six against Northern Colorado to pull themselves up to 8-10. and 10. Three of their wins last week came by one-run victories, a statistic the Vibes have done surprisingly well at the season, going 9-4 and four overall in one-run games. But they blew an opportunity to rise to second in the division last night as their bats fell asleep in a 9-3 to three series opening loss. Consistent production at the plate, as well as better run prevention, will be key for them to get back into an already blown open South division. For Ogden, despite only being slightly behind their first half pace, their 10-8 and eight record is still four games behind the first-place Rockies. This gap is owed in part to the Raptors losing four of six to Grand Junction last week, including one loss that came via a walk-off Grand Slam. Uh, they'll be pleased to have won the opener last night to end a two-game losing streak, but they'll need to do more to do more to recover to their poor performance so far uh, last week. Luckily for them, uh, this matchup with the Vibes is the perfect opportunity. They've won five of seven against Rocky Mountain, and will be looking for more this week. Now, staying in the South Division, we have the 14 and five Rockies visiting their cross-state rivals, the eight and ten Owls. Grand Junction's excellent start to the half has not gone without reward as the Rockies currently set three games ahead of every other team in the PBL. They stretched out their lead in the South Division with a series win against Ogden last week and come, in come into tonight on a three-game winning streak, scoring at least 11 runs in all three of those games. Wow. On top of that, they've won nine of their last 11 in a stretch which they've averaged nine and a half runs per game, cementing their spot as legitimate contenders. The remaining schedule for the second half is solely against teams that are below 500 right now. Mm. So if they can't maintain that division lead, they'll only have themselves to blame. For their nocturnal counterparts, the Owls' status on the outside looking in has only been enhanced by their one and five nocturnal? record. Wait, 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 wait. Did you just yes. say nocturnal counterparts? Yes, I did. 
That is a Vin Scully esque <laughs> way of putting it, Austin. I don't mean to interrupt you. That was beautifully done. Go ahead, Austin. Well, the Nocturnal Owls have gone one in five in the last six and have fallen way behind pace. Uh, they won twenty to four over Rocky Mountain on Saturday, which seemed like a redeeming moment for them. But after giving up thirty-four runs in their past two games, it's all gone away. Uh, despite the team averaging over 10 runs per game in August, they've only won two of those games as their pitching has been uh, routinely exploited by their opponents. And 23 of, of, I believe, their 29 games left in the half come against Ogden and Grand Junction, the two best teams in the division. So for them, this road to contention is looking more like a mountain. Good Lord, Austin. You're on your game tonight, brother. I took notes. Ben Scully <laughs> is smiling from heaven above and uttering the name of Austin Murphy tonight. That is very well done. All right, Austin. Thank Matthias, you. you got a tough act to follow here, my man. Great Falls at Glacier. You there you go. You're there. Yeah, I'm here. So we have which means 20 overall. And 11-9 and nine in the second half, third in North Division, uh, facing off against the Glacier Range Riders in Flathead Valley, who are 24-42 overall and 7-13 in the second half. For the second half in a row, they are in last place in the North Division, which is unfortunate. Going for Great Falls, we have Brian Pooler, who is 2-2 with a 5.09 ERA. And going for the Range Riders, we have Kevin Kyle, who's 0-2 with an 8.64 ERA. But I will add that he's fresh out of college, and he had a very good season at Georgia Gwinnett College. He was 6 0 with a 1.38 ERA this year. The Voyagers took game one 14 6, so they're looking to keep the good times rolling. Riley Jepson has been outstanding for them. He's hitting 413 with a 529 on base percentage and a 672 slugging. 10 homers, 49 RBIs. He's fourth in the PBL in batting average, leads the league in on base percentage. And Braden Daniel, another outfielder, he's hitting 342 with a 457 on base, a 553 slugging. He has 10 homers. He's also stolen 24 bases, so he's third in the PBL in that category. Mm -hmm. And Glacier, meanwhile, of course, is led by the scorching hot Brady Wofford. 15 homers, a sixth in the PBL, and he's hit eight in his last nine games. 16 doubles, 56 RBIs. He was our reigning North batter of the week. So he's on fire right now, as he said earlier. Seven homers in the first half, and he's already hit eight in the second half. And then Ben McConnell, their center fielder, is actually leading the PBL in stolen bases with 33, or tied for th for first in steals with 33. He's not much of a power guy, but he gets on base. He has mm -hmm. a lot of bases, so he's a very good leadoff hitter. So that's the matchup we have going on at Flyhead Valley today, and it's it seems like it's a pretty intriguing matchup. Matthias, thank you very much. And last but certainly not least – Owen Trainer, uh, going to handle a couple of things here for us, Owen. The Boise Hawks playing in Missoula tonight. But you're also going to bring us uh, up to date on what happened last week in the PBL and the players of the week. So, Owen, the stage is all yours. How are you, Matt? Doing good. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, in Missoula where Boise comes in at 5-14. and 14. They're 22-45 and 45 overall this year. Uh, they've lost four of their last six in their last series against Idaho Falls, and they lost uh, last night 7-3 in Missoula. Uh, they're led by their outfielders. The top three players on their team in hits are Teixeira, Cruz, and Jorgensen, which are all playing in their outfield. Uh, as a team, their batters are ranked first in strikeouts, first into in ground into double plays, and last in runs. So hopefully some of their offense can come out tonight. On the other side, Missoula is 11 and 8 in the second half, 46 and 20 overall, and they have already clinched a uh, playoff berth. Their last series was versus Great Falls, where they split it, three wins, three losses. However, in their last three games, they have nine home runs, so a lot of power, and they are a powerhouse. They're top three in all of runs, hits, home runs, and RBIs. Their offense is just incredible. They've also had 16 home runs and 55 RBIs in seven games this August. And I want to keep a Missoula theme. We're going to move towards the players of the week. You guys saw from Jason Newman already. He broke the single season home run record. I mean, I, I really don't know what else to say about this kid. Like, it, it's incredible. He's yeah, he, 27 he's, he's home an runs. amazing player. He really is. You're right. You're right. He, he's incredible. And yeah. any pitches, too. Let's not forget about that. Um, so he was our North Division co batter of the week. He shared that with Brody Wofford, who we also got to speak to mm -hmm. from Glacier. Eight home runs in his last eight games, 
four home runs this past week, including a grand slam. Really good power display. I don't know what he was talking about. He's tied for fourth this year in home runs in the PBL. I think he's a power hitter. Uh, we'll move on to the North Pitcher of the Week. Tyler Noman of Great Falls went a full nine innings in his last appearance, struck out eight, and only wow. allowed one earned run. I think that's the first time that's happened this year in the PBL that a pitcher has went a complete game. Wow. Moving to the south, we have Rocky Mountain Vibes, Gio Diaz, who had 14 hits in six games. Uh, he doesn't really hit the ball that far, but he hits it hard, and he gets on base a lot. He, he really gets the the ball rolling for uh, Rocky Mountain. And we'll move to the last pitcher, uh, Ronnie Orta on Ogden, went seven innings, allowed two earned runs. He had 10 strikeouts and only walked one player and got the win for his team. Owen, thank you very much. How about the standings? How are we looking? Uh, pretty good. We, we have uh, Idaho Falls on top looking to make a push, make a playoff berth. Missoula already has their mm -hmm. playoff locked up. And then the other side, Grand Junction has had a really good second half. Ogden already clinched. And we see a lot of these other teams that are still close. There's not that many uh, games back for a lot of these teams. So it's still early. A lot of teams are still in it. We'll see what happens in the future. Well, I think we only have about uh, a little less, what, uh, uh, Bill, a little less than about, what, three weeks in the regular season, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Right around right around this time. Well, a little longer than that, maybe about, about three and a half, four weeks left in the regular it's, season. It's the pennant stretch. We're in the yes, pennant it, stretch right yes, now. Yes, it is. Owen, thank you very much. All right, fellas, uh, what, what do you got going on this week? Joe, you're back on the road. Is that the deal? Yeah, I'm heading to Nashville this weekend. Zane's Las Vegas, baby. Yeah, I can't. I can't wait. And then uh, I go to Austin next week for one day, and then I head to uh, Cincinnati. Going to the tennis tournament Thursday, and I'll be in Liberty Friday and Saturday. Yeah, that tennis tournament is a big league tournament outside yeah. of the top four in the world. That's that's probably the next in line. It is incredible, both men and women. Um, Joe, but before I ask Billy, um, um, you were talking about going to Nashville now. You don't strike me. I could be totally wrong on this. You don't strike me as a country music guy. Are you a country music guy? No, I'm a Springsteen guy, as you see here. Springsteen and, uh, you know, Eddie Vedder over here. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm a, I'm a rock and roll guy, but I can get into some country. I like the old country, the real country. I like Johnny Cash and uh, Chris yeah. Christopherson, Waylon Jennings. I don't like the pop crap but uh i'll go anywhere you know when in rome whatever I'll, I'll, i'm a shapeshifter whatever you guys like i like what is this that's up on here those are my albums those are two of my i haven't updated my website since 1988 i'm not great at business but those are my two old albums i got another you look like elvis costello in that shot there on the right oh thank you my most recent special this year's material is uh is is based on his album this year's uh model Really, so Costello guy, and my first Letterman appearance, he was the musical guest. Did you meet him? Wow! No, I was shitting my pants in the back. I couldn't meet him. <laughs> <laughs> I was trembling and crying like a schoolgirl in the back. I couldn't say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. My language is atrocious. Well, you still on this could show. have met him even after you had shit in your pants. You still <laughs> <could have laughs> said hello. Um, no, I didn't get to see him. But um... all right, all right, Billy, what do you got going on this week? Where are you? You traveling? You hanging out? You I'm in. Uh, I just got back from uh, visiting my uh, kids, grandkids in Utah. I'm just screwing around in Southern California for a week, then I'll head back there. I got a game in Arizona I got to go to. I think it's a perfect game event. The, the, it's actually the perfect game All-American Classic, which will this year be in uh, at the Arizona Diamondbacks ballpark. I was going to say, I bet you that's got to be inside. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. nice for the Diamondbacks to have you guys in there. That's great. Yep. yep. That's great. All right, fellas, really enjoyed it. want to thank all the guys from Syracuse. want to thank Bob Costas. want to thank Charlie Steiner. I'd like to thank Darren Sutton. We thank Marty Brenneman. Uh, Jackson Shapiro is our uh, producer. And of course, uh, Mike Shapiro and Henry Hunter and company, everybody uh, to make this show happen. Hope you've enjoyed it this week. I mean, th this was a fun show to do and um, really appreciate those guys, Hall of Fame guys um, in Costas uh, and Marty Brenham and joining us tonight. That, that was a, a really fun time. So all the best, everybody. Godspeed. Take care of yourself and the ones you love. 
and even those you don't know. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week on the PBL Roundup. See ya. Peter Bell wine, down the solid wine line.